Uh, good morning, Chair. Morning, colleagues. Morning. Chair, Mr. Mulder. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, all. I must just state that I'm still recovering from a medical procedure, um, but I can't miss out on a meeting like this. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a speedy to recovery to you, Honorable Mulder. Chair, Mr. McPherson. Good morning, all. Good morning. Chair, Ms. Mutahum. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Chair, Ms. Muatse. Good morning, Chairperson, and good morning, colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Chair, those are all members on the platform at the moment. I think one other member may still try to connect with us, Chair, and we have an appointment. Uh, Honorable Malamacha is oh, also on the platform. My apologies. I, I miss, uh, he's on my list. My apologies. I miss Mr. Malamatia. No, morning, Chair. Morning, everybody. I'm present. Good morning. Can we have the agenda for the meeting, please, Ms. Dermans? So there we have the agenda. Uh, uh, can I have apologies, please, um, Ms. Dermans? Chair, we have an apology from Mr. Cuthbert, who's currently on study leave, Chair, and he will return next week, Chair. Okay. Those are the only we... apol apology that okay. I have at the moment, thanks. Yeah. And then um, can we have a move and a seconder for the adoption of the agenda, please? And the agenda consists, of course, of the briefing by the Office of the Auditor General on the audit outcomes of DTIC and its entities, and then the briefing by the minister on the 2021-2022 audit report. Sorry, Chair, Mr. Watts here, is it? Honorable Martse. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I move for adoption of the agenda as uh, presented. Thank you very much, Honorable Martse. Can I have a second for the adoption of the agenda, please? Honorable Motau. Thanks, Chair. I second the adoption of the agenda. Thank you very much. So uh, the purpose of the, the briefing of the Office of the, of the Auditor General General is for the office to reflect on the audit outcomes of the DTIC and the six entities it had assessed for the 2021-2022 financial year. This will provide this portfolio committee with information regarding the accuracy and reliability of reported financial and non-financial performance in the respective annual reports. It will also highlight any key areas affecting governance at the DTIC and these entities. Uh, this information should assist the, co the committee in its oversight role when assessing the performance of the entities, taking into consideration the committee's objective to produce a budgetary review and recommendations report. Um, so I see the minister is on the platform, but I think we are led by Mr. Chab Mr. Shabangu from the Office of the Auditor General. Mr. Shabangu, you may introduce your team and then proceed with the report. Thank you. Can we check whether Mr. Shabangu is on the platform? Morning, uh, apology. 
apology for that. Yes, I'm on the platform, uh, morning chair and morning, morning. to the minister and honorable uh, members and colleagues from the DTIC portfolio. And I'm not alone today. I'm with my colleagues, uh, uh, Mr. Bosa, who, who will be doing the presentation, is the acting manager uh, in the DTIC portfolio, as well as uh, Dr. Ozo CBC, who's also another acting manager in, in our portfolio. And we also have uh, Mr. Tulani Moyo, who's a manager for the NLC group, as well as uh, Manari, who's doing the DTIC audit. Um, Chair, Honorable Chair, this meeting follows uh, a series of meetings that we had with uh, the DG of the DTIC portfolio. Thereafter, we met with the minister, and then we met with yourself uh, last week in preparation of this session to take you through the audit outcomes of the portfolio. But without wasting uh, any time, uh, I'll hand over to Tulo to take us through the presentation. And Chair will be guided by yourself as to how much detail you want us to go through, considering that the, the presentation was shared in advance. We'll be guided by yourself uh, on a road chair. Thanks. Thank you. I think we'll be guided by the time provided. So uh, you can go through your presentations and then we'll uh, take questions and uh, discussion from members. So you may proceed. Uh, thank you. Uh, Zulo, you can you can proceed. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Tsepo, uh, for that introduction. Uh, I requested Itani to to present the slide on my behalf while I present. I don't know if he has uh, access to be able to share the slide. Uh, Itani, if you can please um, assist me with let, let me let me try. I don't know whether I have. Uh, thank you. I don't know whether I have access. Let me try and then. Uh, I will. I will give you access on. now. I didn't know you. You were the one to to to, to share. I will give you access now. Thank you. Maybe while we're waiting and he's trying to present, uh, because the first slide uh, is a, a very normal and general slide that we always start with, uh, which is our mission statement. Uh, so there, I think it's important to note that as part of our processes of audit, too, we always try to ensure that we enable oversight, uh, accountability, and, and governance. So I think for the purpose of this session, this is an important part of trying us to assist in terms of enabling uh, accountability and oversight to various stakeholders, especially this important uh, committee, uh, so that we ensure that it assists in like we, we we assist the committee and give insight for them to to for 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 you to perform your oversight responsibilities. Okay, we can move to the next slide, uh, Itani. Thank you. So, in line with our new uh, the strategy of the new auditor general, uh, we we have acknowledged that uh, as the auditor general office uh, alone, we cannot really. Uh, try and change uh, this accountability, accountability system. So we call on upon all the relevant stakeholders and to say all, all have a role to play international coming accountability, accountability system. Uh, we would have said uh, uh, more details on this in the, in the, in the briefing notes that we have sent before this, this meeting. So this is just to highlight that uh, if all the stakeholders, if all the relevant role players can play their part, as we will demonstrate when we are presenting this, uh, these slides, uh, uh, there is a almost guaranteed impact on the lives, uh, realities of our citizens. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. Uh, okay, maybe it's more. This one is more of a, a, a because we do know that uh, this portfolio doesn't consist only the auditors that we we audit as the auditor in of South Africa. But this was more like to to say upfront that. Although the portfolio has many entities, uh, the purpose of the presentation, Honorable Chair has already said at the beginning of the meeting that we are going to be focused solely on TTIC department and the six entities that were audited by the Auditor General, which is in line with our uh, general report that we will present here, that is presented by the, our AG. Also, on top of that, we do elevate some key messages of concern that we've identified in some entities that are not necessarily 
audited by us, but where because of the guidance or monitoring we try to give to this uh, it is a auditor that are auditing these entities. Uh, so we'll have some slides on NEF and on IPC on some of the messages that we would like to put or elevate uh, for the portfolio committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can move to the next slide. Okay, this is more of an, an introduction slide to the audit outcomes where we want to then show the different uh, audit outcomes and what do they mean before we actually uh, get into the details of the outcome. Uh, obviously, we want to everyone to be on the green part on the unqualified opinion with no findings, which means the clean audit that it is uh, as known. So we want everyone to be there, all the entities and the department to be there. This is where everyone has produced credible and reliable financial statements. And as part of our audit, we did not uh, identify misstatements and compliance with key legislations. And also, uh, the performance information was also useful and reliable for the users. And then on the next one is when we start requesting uh, on that orange uh, box. Uh, there, uh, the financial statements are still unqualified. That means they are still credible and reliable. It could be after the assistant, after the audit, and then some uh, uh, significant or material corrections were made, and then as a result of that, uh, then the financial statements that are then published are free from uh, errors and are credible and reliable. But we still have some issues with compliance, uh, where some we identify issues of non-compliance of key legislation, or the performance information is not useful and reliable. And then the next one, qualified opinion. Uh, as well, where now the financial statements are not credible or not reliable. And then the last two, which are adverse and disclaimer, this is where we are saying uh, at adverse uh, and disclaimer, the financial statements are su like substantial or almost all the amounts and disclosure amounts in the financial statement are either and are not reliable because uh, on adverse, uh, we disagree with the, with the amount that management uh, presented and the supporting documentation that is provided at for audit. And then not just claimed opinion is where management did not give a supporting documentation for almost all the amounts and disclosure notes that are in the financial statement. So with this, uh, uh, honorable members, I'll then proceed to then go in details on the, on the outcomes of the portfolio for the 2021-2022 uh, year. Thank you, Danny. So the next two slides, uh, this slide six and seven, would be like talking to the audit outcomes and the one uh, a small movement that happened in, in the put in the, within these seven audits. So between from 2021 to 2022, there was been like we had three uh, unqualified with no funding research, which means clearly we had three clean audits uh, uh, in the portfolio, and then. On the unqualified findings, so where the financial statement was still unqualified, but uh, the other performance information and uh, compliance legislation had issues. We had two last day, he said it has increased to three. And that is caused by a movement that came from qualified uh, in the previous financial year, where we were two qualified. Uh, what it is, but now we only have one qualified, which is the National Insurance Commission. The one that progressed is. A national regulator for compulsory specific for compulsory specific specification, which is NRCS. So NRCS has uh, improved after seven or eight years of getting qualified opinion. They've improved in the current financial year to be unqualified with findings. Uh, I just want to maybe while we are still there, just want to warn the committee there on that one because uh, one of the key measures of the improvement of of, of this. Uh, entity was the CFO who was driving the, the performance and driving the, the credible and, and, and reliable financial reporting, who has since subsequently left the organization. Not to say that because the CFO has left the, the entity, the rest, but we're hoping that the, the processes and the controls that the CFO has established will be continue to be maintained so that you allow that the the entity can maintain its unqualified opinion on the financial statement. Thank you. Okay, yeah, this slide is also showing the improvement, which is NRCS that I just spoke about. We can move to the next slide. Okay, the next one. 
on the portfolio performance, I think this is where in line with our new uh, strategy and cash shift, this is also where we want to drive an awareness and uh, the, the message that uh, we have key messages that we want to elevate and we are showing awareness on how to say the the performance information reported and the service delivery they link is there they a direct link that we are able to see by everyone and citizen and by this the, the members of, of the community and all the other role players in the country focus system i'll spend more time on this part of the presentation on the portfolio performance but before we get to the key message that we want to elevate i'll first start with the uh, the performance planning and reporting that uh, it happens, which is a normal uh, annual performance report that is being uh, reported by the department and its entities. So in this uh, cycle uh, reporting, uh, the quality of performance reporting, uh, which was submitted for us for auditing, also the annual performance report for the six of the auditors that we audited uh, was good. And then for one, which is uh, SAPS, the entity, the the quality of performance reporting was not so quite good. As a, as a result, uh, there were uh, material misstatements or material findings that we communicated in the audit report of the SAPS. So this is just to give a background on what happened with SAPS. Uh, the issues was with the planning documents. Uh, the planning documents are supposed to have indicators and targets that are smart, uh, that follow the smart principle. So as part of the, the review of the planning and verifying the, uh, the planning documents, some of indicators and, the, and their targets were not measurable. As a result, of, uh, the, the, the performance information uh, was not useful. Uh, this then translated to, the, for us, when we're auditing the annual performance report, not be able to verify the reliability of this performance information because we, it was not measurable. So we cannot verify if this reported performance information was accurate. So as a result, then uh, we're limited in terms of uh, confirming those indicators reliability. As a result, uh, the performance information uh, was not uh, totally uh, useful and, and totally reliable for SAPS, which resulted into findings that were audit, uh, reported in our audit report. We can move on, uh, Itani. Thank you. And then the next uh, three slides, which is like 10, 11, and 12, I'll do more again, still on the performance information. Then we're trying to then try now to, to be more intentional in terms of linking this performance information to the, to the uh, impact that it, it, it have on the, on, the, on the country and the on service deliver. Uh, we did uh, perform some work uh, or some analysis uh, from our office where we look at the indicators that are in the MTSF and to look that are uh, which are linked to the portfolio and look at the indicators to see if which indicators can we consider them as key indicators or key targets in, in the framework and then we'll have to do more work on them and try to see if us achieving these indicators is assisting in terms of service delivery. Obviously there is no methodology in that and this is not part of the audit work that we do to report in the audit report that was uh, reported on 31 July, but it was more work where we're now trying to go deeper and see how the performance information uh, enhances service delivery. And then obviously for part of today's session, we want to drive that awareness also to the portfolio committee. And as Tepo indicated earlier, we had some sessions with the DGs, with the minister, and to ensure that we drive this conversation and make sure all the relevant role players coming to party and then we're able to together try and get uh, a solution in terms, of, in terms of linking this uh, performance information uh, results to service delivery. So we identify those indicators and on top of identify those indicators as you can see from the graphs uh, below uh, you can see that the performance of the of the portfolio uh, is, is, is quite good except for SA APS which is uh, below 60 percent which is linking also to the fact that we identify some issues at SAPS where, and because of the information that is not reliable, it's also not easy to monitor the performance and then ensure that they are improving the performance and achieving against their indicators and targets. I'd like also maybe from this slide to apologize to the person. 
uh, because we met with the topics in, in the past week, the slide might have a little, a slightly different to what I presented to the topics in last week Friday, especially in RCS where I indicated 80% achievement against the target, but it's 60% against the, the against the overall targets for NRCS. Uh, apologies to the normal perceptions for that, but we corrected uh, after the reviews that happened prior to this uh, setting and also prior to ascending the final uh, presentation to the committee uh, last week. If we move to the next one, Itani. Okay, thank you. Uh, honorable members, this is, I think, our new uh, key message that is different from what we've been presenting in the prior uh, years in terms of the our audit outcomes where we just uh, tell you the outcomes and the uh, root causes of issues and the recommendations this year we this is the part where we message we are trying to elevate and trying to have all the role players to reflect on the performance and then link it to the service delivery we use the this key indicator that i spoken about earlier on that uh, we're saying our key indicators, and then we we'll see how did the department performed against them. As you can see in the slides uh, here, uh, the TIC Competition Commission and the NLC, NLC Group, uh, they all achieved in these key indicators that we identified for them, uh, which then begs the question, if, if we're saying they did achieve, uh, and that means whatever would blend them to achieve uh, as when we're setting these uh, targets and the indicators and we're designing them, there was obviously the, the, the goal in mind is to see an impact, uh, uh, to see the change in the economy, uh, which is part of the mandate of the portfolio, in the job creation, which is also mandate of the portfolio. And how can you then say, if you look at this and the priority of the portfolio in terms of the MTSF, looking at these indicators being achieved and some are being overachieved, is there a uh, a confirmed, can you confirm that through the lived experience uh, or the realities of our citizens in the country, their economy, the, the level of jobs, the level of unemployment, can you then say us achieving in these targets and these indicators, is it then also an achievement in terms of the what the mandate of the department? So this is what the question uh, or the awareness we're trying to raise and the reflection that we need to say, we want to try to raise to all the role players and of, and of course to the combat as part as part of the oversight to ensure that when we approve the next planning document these are the questions we are thinking about these are the things we're looking and saying how can we then improve uh, this uh, performance information we then uh, when, if we go to the next slide Itani, we then also as part of our process of doing this as a transition try to look at the planning document of the prior year that we audited and look at the program that we audited uh, audited and obviously uh, uh, again, like I did mention earlier, this is not necessarily a part of audit work that we did and we reported on, but this is more of a work that we did uh, of a reflection post audit and say, how can we look at this and improve this? Yes, uh, the, plan, the planning documents, yes, the, the, the reported performance information was reliable and it meets all the thing, uh, the, the ticks in terms of the framework for reporting, but now let's look at then how do the, can we then link this to service delivery? How does this impact our people? And you do take an example of this one indicator. If uh, I could just say briefly click to this indicator, this, in, this indicator and this target are talking to a report on infrastructure, infrastructure supported in targeted areas. And then obviously to achieve that uh, uh, on that indicator, there is a report that must be produced uh, by the department. And then we look at it and say, if you do this report and you achieve on this report, uh, I would then say we're going to be able to achieve the output and outcome of this indicator, uh, which is the output being the infrastructure development to unlock activities and support of the district market. Can we say by producing this report, we'll have achieved that output. Uh, also the outcome, the increased accessible industrial finance measure to support investment in priority sectors in line with approved master plan. So I was saying with well, this report, as achieving this report, it also means that we've at, achieved in achieving the outcome and the output that we have in, in this stage and what we're trying to achieve by setting these indicators and targets. So this is a part we we'll say, let's reflect and see how can we then make, be more intentional in terms of 
what we want to achieve in terms of service delivery and how can we use those measures, which are the indicators and targets to ensure that we link them and make sure that with us setting this, designing these indicators and targets, we are really uh, uh, achieving also on the outcomes and output. And of course, ultimately on the MTSA by 2030, then when we look back, we are saying we have achieved what we have planned to achieve in terms of the MTSA. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. Thanks. So after then we've done that assessment and look at those and hopefully we'll reflect more and probably have a, a time to discuss more uh, with the committee and uh, we then uh, moved to some uh, other messages where we wanted to bring to the attention of the committees on other work that has happened and messages that we, uh, we have from performing our audit web. Uh, the honorable members will, rem will remember of the post unrest economic recovery a support uh, that was uh, provided by the portfolio, the TIC portfolio. So we did look at, at, at some of the work, and uh, I know as auditors, we are always uh, regarded as people who always uh, come with only report on bad news or bad things. But I think on a lighter note here, we wanted to just say from the work done on the, the TIC portfolio, on the on the response to this post unrest economy uh, that happened in, in Kazakhstan and Houting uh, last year. Uh, the entities in the portfolio, which is the TIC, NEF, and ITC, uh, had, some, had some work to do. And there was an, a, an improvement that we've seen, especially in the rate of dispensing of funds. Uh, one, especially with uh, ITC, when we did, when this uh, initiative started with COVID 19, we had noted in our special report uh, then that the ITC was taking time to displace funds. We have noted now that there is a progress uh, that is happening and now the funds are being dispersed much more faster, which is going to be able to assist in time uh, with the needs of the, our citizen. And also our audit observation, which is a key thing to say, not that the funds are just dispersed for the purpose of, of being dispersed, but our our observation, we did not identify a significant control deficiencies in these disciplines of funds. And so the funds are more, almost likely being it is paid uh, to the right people and for the right purposes. Uh, thank you. <sighs> okay, uh, so now I'm going to be on the on the next two or three slides. I'll be looking at some of the messages uh, for certain entities that we we believe the committee uh, would of interest to the committee to know those messages. Uh, which might have come from uh, from our audit work and also things that are important for the community to to, uh, to able to assist them in their in their oversight. And I think it's it's only natural that uh, as part of our audit outcomes, uh, and then NLC being the only one with qualifications, uh, audit qualification as the India finance statement, uh, being the first one to appear in these uh, messages that we are trying to elevate for these entities. Uh, for NLC, there are two, uh, two key messages that we want to elevate to the committee. Uh, the first one is on crime funding, and the other one is on uh, legal fees uh, uh, that we identified or that were uh, disclosed in the financial statement where, uh, of, of the entity. So on the crime funding, uh, uh, there has been allegations against uh, NLC management in terms of the money being used uh, through various NPOs and NPCs and based on collective relationships. Uh, we also have identified some key or weaknesses, uh, weaknesses in the in this uh, in this process of grant funding. And these weaknesses almost uh, confirms the allegations against uh, the management or against the, the entity NLC to say uh, if these weaknesses cannot and not resolve on time, whatever is happening, then there are chances uh, of that uh, money might not be used for internet purposes. As part of to, to try and paint this picture, we used uh, two examples, but the example, I'm not going to much into detail the example, I'm just going to show the key issue for each, for each example. For the first one on Ubus NPC, the key, the issue there was on variation orders. There's been a significant variation orders on projects through grant funding where they 
the variation orders are as big that they can all miss the initial approved amount of the project. So this is a key concern that we are raising to the portfolio committee to say, one of our members, please, well, part of your oversight, uh, please look at this and ensure, to ensure that it's, it's being kept uh, and the, the, the project are done using, uh, using the amounts that were approved initially as much as possible. And then I think our key message, uh, our key issue again uh, that we want to raise was the issue of progress reports. It's either not being used adequately or not being used at all. Uh, one instance is where uh, the key, the project uh, report will indicate that the, in, uh, the performance from the previous uh, trench of payment that was paid is not satisfactory but still there will be payment that will still be made for the second trends of payment will be made before the actual issues of the second of the first report were resolved. So this, the, this means that uh, amount are being spent uh, or tranches are being displaced with understanding ensuring that there is value that is being derived on the ground in these projects. We have attached at the, back, uh, at the end of this presentation uh, more, more uh, weaknesses that we identify in the annexures for the benefit of the community to, to look at and read and ensure that uh, to assist them with the insight uh, on this regard. On the next slide, I will then look at uh, local fees or local expenses. Yeah, as part of audit, uh, we will do some analysis and interpretation of the financial statement. So we did uh, identify a very uh, worrying trend in the local fees, uh, which have increased uh, by almost 91% from the previous year. Uh, this is very uh, concerning uh, in terms of the nature and, uh, and operations of the entity. And also, it is we want to note that these uh, legal expenses uh, are not as a result of the entity defending itself against litigation, but they are initiated by management uh, of, the, of the NLC. And also, this is on top of the 9 million rents of the salaries and wages of the local unit of the entity. So we're saying this uh, 37 increase, 37 million increase in in in, in local fees uh, is is worrying some and needs to be uh, looked at and ensure that if there is a way to cap it, and then it can be kept. Also, maybe as a, as a as part to note that is. Uh, part of our qualification area, uh, the qualification area on regular expenditure, the legal fees, uh, appointment of these uh, legal uh, attorneys also included in the in the irregular expenditure, which was not disclosed, which resulted in the audit report being qualified as we had indicated that the irregular expenditure was not complete in the financial statement. Thank you. We can move. After looking at NLC, then we look at another entity that we think the community need to uh, have a deeper or closer look at it, which is South African Bureau of Standards. Uh, the, the issues are current issues, uh, which are mainly caused by a lack of a fully constituted and functional board of directors, and also uh, without a permanent chief executive officer since 2018. So in the past, since 2018, there's not there has not been a fully functional board and there's not been a permanent CEO. And as a result, this has got some uh, governance issues and uh, some of the highlight, uh, highlight or key issues that you've uh, have identified is the, the decline in revenue and there's been loss of critical skills, uh, uh, which also will probably contribute to the decline in revenue and losses by the group. Uh, so we we call, we've also had some engagement with the minister where we call upon uh, the minister to make sure that uh, the, 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 the accounting authority is uh, established uh, in the entity. Uh, the minister did make a commitment, but obviously uh, the minister did also indicate that it's not about just uh, appointing uh, the board and making sure it's there, but supporting the right people with the appropriate skills to ensure that when the board is fully established, it can then assist in terms of uh, moving the entity to uh, forward. And of course, you will have seen in the previous slide when we spoke about performance information, SAPS is the one entity that is underperforming in the portfolio. So we need 
to ensure that these climate issues are solved expeditiously, and then we can then move forward in terms of addressing the performance issues of the entity. Thank you. We can move to the next slide. Another entity uh, which I wanted to have a message on is the Industrial Development Corporation, IDC, uh, uh, which is not audited by us as part of our normal audit, uh, but it's a scheduled entity, scheduled two entity, and so we, it's an entity that we always have, although we are not necessarily auditing, but we always have maintain a closer relationship with the uh, auditors, and also because of the initiatives that they do, also try and make sure that we follow up and ensure that those initiatives participate with those initiatives. One initiative that what they were supposed to implement in this uh, year or on the past year of audit 2021-2022 was the presidential employment stimulus and they were responsible for social employment fund initiative uh, through DTIC. So there was a budget allocation of 800 million uh, for uh, ITC uh, and the plan was to create 50,000 jobs. As at year ended 1 March 2022, uh, zero was spent and automatically uh, there were no jobs yet created uh, from. So this initiative had not yet happened. Uh, we, had, uh, we had had some engagements with the minister, uh, with the DGs on this uh, and the department, and there were some context behind it and the, uh, of why these uh, funds were not spent. And it is because uh, this fund was allocated as part of the adjustment to the 2021 yeah, in, as a result, the funds were received late and were uh, transferred late to the ITC. As a result, by 31 March 2022, uh, not much was done. Uh, from the engagement that we've had uh, with the minister and the DG, there has been a, a confirmation or there has been indication that work has started and a lot, has, lot of work has done, but uh, from our side, we will follow up on, on that work on the next period cycle. Thank you. Okay, the last entity to look at as part of our message that we are trying to elevate is the National Empowerment Fund, another OGT that we don't audit as Auditor General. But one uh, issue that we wanted to elevate here is the issue that uh, NEF has, is a group, has two subsidiaries. So NEF, as you can see in the outcome that I have uh, put there, they were, had, they were financially unqualified with no findings on predetermined objective and compliance with key legislation as the, as the separate entity. But because they have two entities that support one of them, so at group level, uh, the, unfortunately, the, the clean audit could not be maintained. It was because of the irregular expenditure that was incurred by these two entities. The reason for this irregular expenditure was because uh, the, these two entities uh, would normally apply for exemption, which is granted by the Minister of Finance to be exempted from complying with PFMA. But in this current, in the previous financial year, uh, these exemptions were not granted on time due to the applications that were not done on time. And as a result, by year end, all those uh, the exemptions were not granted and all the expenditure that was incurred, uh, not in accordance with PFMA, then became a regular expenditure. So we call on the uh, the flag and roll players to ensure that these applications are, not, are done in time and also consider having this application maybe in 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 three years, not necessarily having to request for them every financial aid to allow for proper planning because if this was probably done for three years, then there will there will have not have been a need for the outbreak approval by the minister and then this regular expenditure could have been easily been avoided. Thank you. Then I'll look at the material regularities. Uh, here, I think the key thing is just say for at this stage for the DTIC portfolio, we not have yet identified the material regularities in line with our new or with our amended, uh, amended uh, Public Audit Act, where we're given uh, more power to implement the material regularity process. We are currently as the, as the office implementing it on a piecemeal. Uh, basis, uh, adding, adding entities and entities that are global and eventually all ed, all entities and departments will be under this process. But at this stage, we have added quite a few. Uh, and at this stage, uh, nothing has been 
has been identified and reported in terms of the material regularities uh, for the TTIC portfolio. But the audit work continues and then things may change in, in no time, but at this stage we haven't identified anything. Uh, thank you. Now we're going to look at the financial uh, uh, reporting, quality of financial reporting and also compliance with key legislation. When you look at the quality of financial reporting, we're looking at the financial statement to see if the financial statement that were submitted for audit were credible and reliable, and then subsequently after audit, the financial statement that were also applicable to the portfolio community are also uh, credible and reliable. So if you look at those graphs there, uh, before audit, is what is the financial statement that we have received uh, to audit, and the green at the top, uh, TTICC, APCC, those were unmodified to saying that the financial statement that we received did not have a material misstatement. So when the financials that we received for audit were credible and reliable. But for the other four entities, which is NCR, say, SAPS, NCRS, and NLC, the financial statement that we received uh, contains some errors that required management to correct them before the final, final financial statement were issued. And then after the audit process happened and the correction has happened, uh, three uh, entities, which is NCR, SAPS, and NCRS moved to the green side and only one of that NLC because they could not process uh, these uh, corrections or the correct corrections on time for interpreting. So NLC has remained as the only entity uh, in the portfolio or in, in these seven uh, entities to have a qualified opinion in the financial statement. Uh, the qualification is on a regular expenditure that has been disclosed, which is coming from deviations from procurement contracts that were awarded based on criteria that differ from the original classification and specification for us that do not stipulate a minimum threshold for local production and content. So this is very important to have, especially with us driving these uh, new messages of saying we must implement uh, uh, indicators and targets that impact service delivery. We need uh, quality financial reporting as a basis to, to start uh, this change. So it's important that NLC also, we assist the NLC to move from where they are to the green side to ensure that uh, they're having their own good quality financial statement because poor quality financial statement will result in, will impact the ability of all the relevant stakeholders in making uh, right decisions and ensuring that these decisions are, and that is the able to impact uh, uh, the citizens. For example, with the NLCS, the regular expenditure, if it's not complete, then the next step for regular expenditure for management is to then investigate that regular expenditure and, and institute consequence management. And in this case, if it's not complete, that means the investigation is only complete because there'll be some regular expenditure that's not complicated, and which then automatically means the consequence management that is going to be done and not going to be complete. So it's important that we ensure that the reporting is is credible, is reliable to then allow the other steps and next steps to take place uh, from using reliable information. Okay, we can move to the next slide, Tani. Okay, this slide is more on financial aid of the department and entities. I don't think for this one I will very much because as things that the, the department and entities overall, uh, the whole of the portfolio is uh, looking quite good in terms of financial health, and also there are no going concern issues that we are concerned about. So at this at this stage, the financial health of the portfolio is uh, is good, as indicated by these uh, ratios and, and indicators that we will have performed as part of our audit work. You can move it, Danny. Okay. Now looking at compliance with key legislation, uh, on this slide, as you can see, I think there the are two key things that I want to highlight. Uh, the, one of the key non-compliance is the quality of financial statements. So the financial statements that have been prepared and submitted for audit uh, are not of quality, are not prepared in terms, in, in terms of the uh, appropriate uh, accounting framework as required by the TFMA. This resulted in those four audit uh, uh, auditees having uh, non-compliance issues. And then another key issue is to say, if you look at those affected auditees for each of these areas of non-compliance, 
NLC since what here because most it appears under quality of finance that means appear again under procurement and product management. That means when they are procuring, uh, they are not always complying with the FFO, with, with PFMA, and again they are not having steps to prevent irregular uh, expenditure. And then of course because of that they also uh, are not effective uh, affecting consequence management one time. So uh, NLC is one uh, entity that is seem to appearing all these. Uh, non-compliance areas and that, that, that there must be a closer look to ensure what NRC is, is assisted to move uh, uh, from these uh, non-compliance with key legislations. Okay. okay, another thing that comes from non-compliance is the regular expenditure uh, as a result of the non-compliance that happen, especially uh, uh, procurement and contract management, then there's some regular expenditure that comes out of that, and then it is disclosed. Uh, you will see that from 2021 to 2022, there's a big increase of regular expenditure from 23 million to 78 million. Uh, the biggest increase is caused by NLC, uh, which with 68 million uh, regular expenditure that came from uh, NLC. Uh, again, it also speaks to the effect that uh, the regular, like, there was non-compliance on procurement and corrupt management on the previous slide, and also non-compliance on prevention of irregular expenditure. And so NLC has been the, uh, the major contributor of irregular expenditure. And also, I think it's also to, uh, important to note that the amount that we put here, the amount that we have disclosed in the financial statement, this is actually the amount that we say uh, the irregular expenditure is incomplete and not included in the financial statement. And then uh, on still on compliance on all members, uh, the one part like that we also look at is after this regular expenditure has been disclosed. So now this slide is looking at the balance. The previous one is looking at the amount that is incurred annually the regular expenditure, but the balance becomes cumulative. Obvious the some balance become it can be reduced or it can increase based on what has happened and how it was dealt with. So if we looked at the prior year, which is 2020-21, the regular expenditure of 174 million, how it was dealt with in the current year. So if you look there on that slide, only 13 million has been successfully condoned at this stage, and uh, which means 161 million is not dealt with, is it's not condoned, is not being recovered in process of recovery or not treating off. Uh, the picture looks uh, bad, but I think for more context, uh, uh, the bigger chunk of this 161 million is 99 million that is coming from CAPC. And this uh, regular expenditure, there was investigation that happened, and it, it emanates from a long time ago, I think around 2010, where there was investigation that happened. But after this uh, regular expenditure was identified, uh, the entity uh, stopped the uh, uh, the contract and then the, con the supplier of the contractor took the entity to court and there's been a current case which did not allow this regular expenditure to then continue and be condoned. So from the recent uh, development, but which year after year end, uh, the subsequent development indicates that the, since like the state attorney has given a clear right that the court case is not, is not going to continue and then the entity must uh, start a process of reducing or condoning this regular expenditure. So we're hoping that by the next uh, financial year, this regular expenditure will have been dealt with and a significant part of it will be dealt with and then there will be low balances or closing balances of irregular expenditure. Okay. Yes, uh, now to go to the conclusions uh, recommendation, we had some based from this whole presentation and all the other outcomes, uh, there were some broad causes uh, or key causes that were identified uh, and then some recommendations uh, to the accounting officer and accounting authorities and also to the uh, executive authority and and I indicated earlier, we had some meetings with the minister and uh, some uh, few commitments that we did get from the minister. Uh, looking at the root causes uh, at NLCs, we will try to be more specific to entities that they were uh, significant issues. 
uh, low response by management uh, on prior audit findings, which resulted in significant findings in the portfolio. And of course, then also cause there's a lack of consequent management uh, because of this low response. At SAPS, I think we have already said that there are issues, governance issues, uh, which are mainly true to the board not fully constituted, which also caused the instability of, in, in, of vacancies in key position as a result of loss of critical uh, skills. And then we had some recommendations. Uh, uh, some recommendations includes uh, adequate controls that must be put in place to prevent irregular expenditure. Uh, and then furthermore, there must be controls to uh, to identify and record on this and record this irregular expenditure so that it allows for all the role uh, players to know what's the irregular the impact in, of this irregular expenditure. And then this will also allow more consequence management investigation to take place. It will also need the, the need for proper control to prepare and review financial statement. Uh, irregular expenditure must be investigated and disciplinary steps or actions should be taken. Uh, we noted that uh, at NLC there has been a recognition uh, of the commissioner, CFO and CEO. Uh, so these vacancies, which are key vacancies, uh, need to be uh, filled uh, timely to ensure that uh, there are no controls uh, in the, uh, the whole, there are no weaknesses in the control environment, and of course, uh, a, a more uh, obvious uh, a recommendation for us in terms of governance uh, issues uh, for SAPS is to say uh, an appointment of a fully functional board to lead and govern the entity is needed. Uh, again, for NOCS, although they have improved. Uh, the sea of vacancy that has since, since uh, uh, happened must be appropriately addressed timely to avoid the risk of regression in the audit accounts. Uh, like I said, we did have a meeting with the minister and we had some commitments from the minister. Uh, the prime minister did promise more engagement uh, with the office of the AG in terms of ensuring that we look at these indicators and how can we improve them to ensure this uh, the quality of indicators and targets it talks to the uh, service delivery and improve the life of our people. Uh, the process of appointing a, board, a fully functional board at, it is, at SAPS will be finalized when the right candidates uh, with right competencies are being identified. And then the uh, minister also indicated that they will be introducing lifestyle bodies to assist with improving integrity of the entities and, and of the board. And then irregularities will be investigated and consequence management will be implemented. And with that, this takes me to the final slide of my presentation, which is the message to the to the you honorable members, uh, the portfolio committee. Now, there's the next slide, Itani. Thank you. Uh, there's one final slide. But it was on that final slide and then it went out. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Before we actually go to the key message for the current year, we had some recommendations that we did also in the previous year. Uh, we first want to reflect on that and then uh, the, the message for the current year. And uh, the key thing on the message from the prior was like progress was to have a uh, monitor uh, reg in regular follow up with the executive authority and accounting officer on the progress on the audit action plan. And then also follow up with entities that indicate the regular progress and regular function to consequence management. And then our reflection on this is the, the audit and action plans have been uh, partially addressed, especially if you look at the issue of NLC, uh, they improved their audit account in terms of moving from the qualified to unqualified. So there's progress there implementing the action plans, uh, the audit action plans, but there's been a slow progress uh, or slow response from the NLC side in terms of responding to these action plans and also in terms of uh, preventing the incurrence of uh, incurring irregular expenditure. So that's the reflection we have and hopefully uh, things will, uh, will change, uh, will be improved also from the NLC and the whole portfolio. And then as a result from the, in this current, uh, 
yeah, this is our overall message uh, to, the, to you, Honorable Members, and the Portfolio Committee of Trade Industry and Competition. Uh, there are still auditors in the portfolio that submit AFS not tripling according to the prescribed and sound reporting format, which speaks to the quality of financial reporting at the auditors. And then we are saying there's still an in, a need for an in-depth review on plan indicators and targets required to increase the impact in the service delivery and to ensure we uh, improve the lives of our people. And then number three, uh, for analysis, uh, the weakness in the grant funding that we discussed above, and of course the uh, the attach the annexure that I included uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, must be quickly addressed. There is a need to quickly address that those weaknesses in grant funding. And then in SAPS again, there is a need to ensure common structures are established to improve sustainability of the entities. Uh, with that, uh, I've come to the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Honorable Members. Thank you very much uh, to the uh, AG's office and uh, led by uh, Mr. Posa, the presentation led by Mr. Posa. <coughs> Excuse me. Members, I just want to check with you whether we will have a question session now to the office of the AG or whether uh, we will take questions and discussions after the minister's presentation on the annual report. If I can just have an indication from members. I don't see any hands. Uh, Honorable Malamecha. Thank you, Chair. I, I think let's rather have the question in Larissa, after both a what you call presentation. Okay, Honorable Burns, Namashi. No, thank you, Chair. I, 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 I would have said the same because, you know, once we deal with it in a piecemeal, it might um, 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 create a, a more dis, uh, uh, integrated kind of uh, engagement. So let's rather have the, the full okay. set than start to raise questions. Thank you very much. Can I then just check uh, with the Office of the AG, uh, Mr. Posa, Mr. Shabangu, whether um, you will be able to remain on the platform for the duration of the meeting? Uh, yes, uh, Honorable Chair, we are at the service today. We will I, remain. I don't hear you. I'm saying we will remain. Okay, that's that's fine. Thank you very much. Then we hand over then to the minister to introduce his team and to take us to the next agenda item, which is the annual report uh, of the department. <clears throat> good morning. Uh, good morning, Chairperson. Uh, good morning to the honorable members. Uh, good morning to the uh, team from the Auditor General's office. Uh, good morning also to the officials who are present and uh, members uh, of the public who may be following the proceedings. Uh, Chairperson, it's my, uh, my pleasure really to um, uh, introduce the team. We have uh, a team of, uh, made up of Deputy Minister Majola, who is here with us, together with a number of officials led by the Acting Director General Shabir Khan. We also have uh, uh, present among others, um, a number of Deputy Director Generals, Malebo Mabichi Thompson on industrial uh, financing, Lerato Mataboche on exports. Uh, we have um, uh, Irene Ramafola, the acting CFO, Nontombi Matumela, the COO, and she's supported by Wongi uh, Mashamvise. Uh, uh, Ambassador Xavier Karim is uh, on the platform, Stephen Hannibal. Uh, Evelyn Masocha, Nimrod Zalk, Yunus Hussein, Mohammed Vauda, and uh, Maute Malifani. Uh, there are also some support officials uh, uh, that uh, may be present on the platform. Jefferson, may I uh, first uh, thank you for the, uh, the opportunity for us to present the annual report. Uh, we have uh, uh, submitted the annual report to Parliament, and we've, uh, in order to organize the uh, presentation uh, of the report, 
we thought it would be helpful just to have a PowerPoint. <clears throat> and I'm going to ask uh, Tsulu just to flight that uh, PowerPoint uh, with your permission. Thank you, uh, Tsulu. What the PowerPoint will seek to do, the presentation is in three parts. The first part will look at the DTIC portfolio as a whole and a few highlights from that portfolio going a little bit wider than the uh, annual performance plan of the department. And I will highlight some of those key areas. Part two of the report will look at the annual performance summary for each of the programs in the department. More of the detail of that will be set out in the, uh, in the tabled report, but I'm asking um, <coughs> uh, Shabir Khan uh, as the acting director general to take the uh, committee through the uh, programs. And then part three will be the financial performance and the audit outcomes, which will be presented by the DTIC team. The next uh, slide is really just a contextual slide. It recalls, Chairperson, that in 2019-20, we uh, <clears throat> commenced the uh, sixth administration. And at the start of the administration, six priorities were identified and implemented. And work commenced that first year on it. And those six priorities, honorable members will recall, was building dynamic industries through partnerships, uh, expanding exports through, uh, among others, the African continental free trade area uh, and other trade uh, arrangements, uh, improving the climate for investment and the level of fixed investment in the economy, promoting spatial equity through targeted policies, uh, work on transformation of the economy and building a capable state. So that was the, the uh, overall vision that we had. In 2020, uh, the priorities were implemented, taking into account COVID-19, the pandemic and the shocks uh, to firms, to consumers, to workers and citizens. And among many things, we use competition and trade regulations. We worked with companies to recover uh, more focus was given to localization, given the enormous disruptions in supply chains. And it included medical supplies, the work on ventilators, on face masks, sanitizers, and in the course of that year, laying the basis for vaccine production. And uh, there was support rendered to firms affected by lockdowns, and as I've indicated, to the enormous challenges globally. Uh, with mo uh, goods moving uh, between countries. In 2021-2022, which is the period covered by this uh, report, we, we did work on all six priorities. They were resumed, but with a focus now on greater integration within the DTIC group. So that's the 10 programs of the department and the work between the departments and the entities. We work more actively with other parts of the state, more focus on partnerships with firms. We worked on a quicker response to deal rest, and we drew on our COVID-19 experience there. We speeded up work on master plans, on exports, on localization, and on transformation. And the, uh, there was greater focus on a, a number of modalities and areas of work around the African continental free trade area and the World Trade Organization uh, uh, talks. And part of this year was also trying to get a greater level of off-balance sheet funding. Now, this first uh, part of the, the uh, presentation, Chairperson and Honorable Members, will really focus on some of the highlights. So they don't go into all the detail, uh, but they, they uh, lift out some of the key areas. The, the work of the department and the application of the budget to that work is on what the department will do. In other words, the steps it will take, the actions it will take, Call it the inputs. 
what this report is beginning to do more is focus on the impact and on the outcomes. And in the new annual performance plan and the reporting that <clears throat> we've uh, put in place inside the department, honorable members will see a greater focus, not on have we administratively complied, that of course we also will report on, but more importantly, what is the impact in society? What is the outcome of the work of the DTIC? So that will be in this new financial year we're in, but we, we, we will highlight a few of the impact and outcome measures in the, in the highlights. The next slide then begins the, the work. <clears throat> What uh, it recalls the work of the that the report that the Auditor General gave covered those audits that the AG's office had directly undertaken. And generally, the AG's office tend to focus on the audits where the risks are significant and where uh, it needs to ensure that um, uh, the team of the Auditor General goes through those things carefully. But there are 18 audits in total that is done for the department, some by the Auditor General, others by uh, large accounting firms that are appointed uh, with uh, uh, the uh, AG's office. If we look at the audit outcomes as a whole, 17 of the, the uh, entities, that's the department itself and entities at unqualified audits, one entity, received a qualified audit outcome, and that's the NLC. The next slide highlights the work that has been done across different parts of the DTIC to secure investment pledges, new, new uh, investment commitments. And for the 2021 investment conference, 366 billion rand of uh, fresh pledges were received. The DTIC hosted the investment conference on behalf of the presidency, and we worked with the other departments to, to secure these pledges. 79 projects were announced, and if we take into account what we call expansions, expansions is where a previous pledge, the company had increased the level of um, uh, uh, capital spending. For example, if I use the example of uh, one of the car companies, they made a commitment, as they undertook this commitment, they realized that they could do a little bit more, so they increased that. Sometimes a pledge is reduced uh, when a project is put on, uh, on hold or canceled. Um, if we take all of that into account, the 79 projects plus the expansions uh, minus the reductions, the total was 366 billion rand. Of that, we started to focus now on getting more commitments from black industrialists and 36.7 uh, billion rand of the total commitments made came from black industrialists who are seeking to expand their businesses, grow their, uh, their firms, uh, increase their output. There was also significant implementation of commitments made at previ previous investment conferences. Some of those <clears throat> are covered in the annual report and some of those we covered extensively itself at the conference. If we add up, the commitments now made over the last four-year period, uh, they amount to 1.1 trillion rand. The five-year target is 1.2 trillion rand. And we have one more conference before this five-year cycle is over. And then the president would, um, uh, we take it, uh, set a new target for the period ahead. The next slide then covers approvals, of investment by the IDC specifically. The IDC provides support in loans and equity uh, for investments, and uh, its total approvals for the financial year was 16 billion rand. Uh, it disbursed about uh, 7.2 billion rand. 5.3 billion rand was approved for black empowered companies, 4.1 billion rand for black industrialists, and 1.4 billion rand was approved for women and youth empowered businesses. Now the IDC approvals are based on putting forward a, a, a proposition, a company would put up a business plan and say, we think we can make this 
business plan work and it fits into the mandate of the IDC. It goes through a process and uh, if it meets the, the, the requirements uh, and the IDC has the resources available, that is approved. The disbursements then flow as uh, each of these projects reach a particular milestone. On the right hand side, we talk about rebuilding the asset base of the IDC. The IDC has not received fresh shareholder uh, monies uh, for probably the last 40 or more years. It's received no new monies in the period of the democracy and for many, many, many years, even prior to that. So the IDC has to uh, work with its balance sheet. It's got to make sure that it's able to to uh, invest in businesses that are profitable, that pay dividends. Uh, it has to use the asset base to go into the money market and borrow money so that it can, uh, it can finance the commitments that it makes to new investors. And therefore the IDC's balance sheet is very important. The pandemic, and I should say the 2020 oil crisis left the IDC balance sheet seriously damaged. Honorable members will recall that there was this strange period um, in, uh, it was about February, March, 2020, when uh, the oil price dropped very, very significantly. And uh, we had a massive drop in uh, uh, shortly thereafter in industrial output across the world because of the pandemic. And these two factors, damage the IDC balance sheet. If we look at the, the IDC mini group, the uh, balance sheet went to um, uh, went down quite significantly. Uh, in by 2020, the balance sheet had been had gone down to 97 billion rand. And um, uh, I met with the IDC board in 2020 and we started the process of uh, working on how to rebuild the IDC balance sheet. Uh, that meant that we we needed to change some of the APP for the IDC, it's called the corporate plan uh, to enable it to have a little bit of relief. Uh, we, we, we lowered some of its targets to give it the space to be able to recover. And uh, in this financial year, the, the recovery got to 158 billion Rand. Uh, and that allows the IDC now uh, to be able to, uh, to do more. If we include companies that are, that are incorporated um, because uh, they are all wholly owned um, subsidiaries of the IDC, or we look at companies that, uh, whose uh, financial statements are incorporated in the IDC because of the level of shareholding, uh, the asset base is, base is even higher. Now, what this asset base does, it allows us to get money on the capital markets at a lower interest rate because the risk profile of the IDC goes down. And that then helps the IDC to bring down the cost that it charges its clients. We also report on the July 2021 unrest response by the IDC, 2 billion rand allocated, uh, just short of 2,000 firms supported, 1.5 billion rand dispersed. And the number of workers covered by uh, all of the firms that the IDC supported and that its intermediary supported is uh, about uh, 26,000 workers. So this points then to the kind of way in which we bring the three elements together, build a strong balance sheet for the IDC, ensure that we can deal with approvals in its core business, which is driving industrialization, but also take into account when you have a uh, unexpected uh, challenge like the July 2021 unrest, that we have to be able to rely on our institutions to, to jump in and assist. And this slide points to those three elements of the work of the IDC. The next slide will then highlight uh, the work uh, by two other entities, the NEF, 1.3 billion Rand in approvals. This is the highest level of approvals uh, and disbursements uh, in its 19 year operational history. Uh, 800 million Rand uh, of the um, the, the money was target, it exceeded that target, <clears throat> and it was able to exceed that target because we were able to secure money from uh, off balance sheet sources. Uh, the, <clears throat> the NAF basically went out in the market and said, we can render service to um, smaller businesses and um, 
uh, empowered firms better than um, uh, is normally done in the market and it was able to attract funding. Uh, it disbursed um, just over a billion rand and this data include its core work as well as the unrest funding. And then finally, the uh, ECIC, which provides risk cover for companies that are in the export market, <clears throat> they approved transactions uh, worth 250 million US dollars in uh, this period. The next slide then highlights the work of the department itself, not the entities, but just the DTIC specifically. And the DTIC uh, approved funding uh, of 6 billion rand in the financial year. This is 196 projects that the uh, department had, um, had approved, 39 billion rand in projected total investment value. So this is when it uses all of the instruments at its disposal and the, the commitments that counterparties in an investment transaction make, uh, the, the um, uh, footprint of it uh, is 39 billion rand. And all of the companies that were supported uh, employed uh, just over 66,000 workers. The next slide then uh, provides information on master plans. And we, we've provided the committee with detailed uh, reports on the master plans, and there's a little bit more information in the annual report itself. So this is just a few highlights. This is not an attempt to replicate an entire presentation, but in the steel master plan, a number of projects in the value chain leverage 1.3 billion rand in new investment and uh, supported just over 2,000 jobs. On global business services in this financial year, the master plan uh, was finalized in a sector that has the potential to create thousands of jobs in the next decade. To give an example, just last year, 130 jobs <clears throat> were created in Cape Town in a global call center called Boulder, and 90% of that will be available to youth uh, employees. Uh, and this is all based on the incentives provided by the DTIC. And then complementing that kind of things, the digital service infrastructure was reinforced by the announcement of 8.5 billion rand of investment in data centers, telecommunications, and software development. And there are tens of thousands of workers currently employed in the sector as a result of the DTIC incentive schemes. The next slide then uh, goes into a little bit more detail on different master plans. It then takes the sugar master plan, the sugar industry was supported to drive transformation and growth. Uh, 225 million Rand was spent on small scale, largely black farmers uh, and the 60 million Rand premium fund was committed by the South African Sugar Association and supported just over 12,800 small scale growers uh, starting from the 2021 season. Now, this money was largely generated from the sugar industry itself through the various measures that the department has put in place. So we were not drawing this money from the fiscus. It's not on the budget that parliament votes on, but it is an important part of the support that we're unlocking for small-scale farmers. So when I talked about using off-balance sheet financing, this is an example of trying to get more done without having to necessarily dip always into the, the, uh, the national budget that the Minister of Finance uh, puts forward every year. To drive localization, there was a, an increase, 22% uh, increase in the procurement of local sugar by soft drink producers. And just to show the connection between these various things, it helped um, Ilova small scale cane development project uh, that I'm advised employs 860 people in KZN. And ShopRite also partnered with local growers and government to promote the sale of locally produced sugar in its uh, stores uh, all over the country. The next slide continues with the master plan highlights. It looks at poultry, uh, 22.5 million. That's the weekly local chicken slaughter capacity that has been developed as a result of increased investment, uh, the South African poultry industry pledged to invest 1.5 billion 
by the end of 2022. And by November 2021, they had reported an investment total of 1.1 billion rand. Uh, and uh, this had created 9.8% uh, additional capacity for emerging farmers. And uh, as I've indicated, it's also helped with slaughter capacity. Uh, from um, <clears throat> uh, the, the work that has been done uh, on a fund uh, that has been set up jointly by the IDC and Dalrad uh, to support new and current expansion across the agriculture value chain. Six poultry value uh, uh, projects valued at, call it about 360 million rand were approved, and they created 204 additional jobs. We also had extra production of soya and maize. Uh, which will be available for feed and export. And this is 9% uh, up from the previous season. And the industry reported that more than 2,000 jobs were created across the value chain. Uh, the next uh, slide goes into the clothing, textile, and footwear uh, uh, master plan. Some highlights there around investment by a company in non-woven textiles in the Western Cape, a company in uh, uh, knitting and dyeing in KZN, and a company in safety, footwear, and PPE in Gauteng. Uh, there was also work on value chain localization. We give the example of the Fushini Group uh, that has now sourced 35% of its clothing locally. We'd like them to increase that uh, further. So if they are listening, I'm sure they'll be working hard on that. Mr. Price also sources 35% uh, of total merchandise uh, locally. And Game uh, looked at a new uh, clothing line, uh, also with a, a component that is locally manufactured. And uh, as was reported to the portfolio committee, quite a lot of work was done to help firms that were damaged in the July 2021 unrest particularly small businesses. We worked with retailers to reestablish supply chains and um, a number of jobs were covered by these. Uh, uh, honorable members will see 49 firms in the CTFL industry, that's the clothing, textile, footwear and leather industry had damage as a result of that unrest and uh, the department and entities <clears throat> worked closely to try to reestablish uh, and support those businesses. The next slide uh, goes into further master plan highlights. It looks at the furniture master plan concluded in this period, uh, and it highlights one of the big investments that was unlocked through a partnership between the department and PG Bison with 2.5 billion rand investment in new manufacturing capacity. And um, particularly important here was this medium density fiberboard plant. Uh, that will have the capacity to uh, replace close to a billion rands worth of imports every year. On the right hand side, it introduces the auto master plan. And um, this financial year was the first operating year of the, just go back one slide, of the, uh, the fund that has been set up to support transformation in the auto sector. Uh, 178 a million rand was approved. Uh, and uh, there were various commitments made by the large auto assemblers uh, for, for 10 enterprises on what can be bought from them, what support they can get uh, over the, uh, uh, the number of, uh, of years. And uh, some of it was realized already in 2021. The next slide then breaks down the uh, auto master plan for one firm. Um, and we take the example of the new C-class Mercedes-Benz that was produced in South Africa. There's only three places globally that the new C-class Mercedes-Benz is produced. It's Bremen in Germany, it's Beijing in China, and it's Buffalo City in South Africa. This was a very large investment. Uh, the the um, <clears throat> company reported 13 billion rand with uh, about 600 new jobs, direct jobs, and 2,000 jobs in the value chain. There's a number of black owned uh, suppliers uh, and uh, one of them, uh, VM Automotive form part of the suppliers 
uh, a program that the company has and they've introduced what they call laser blanking as a new technology in this new generation C class. We then in the next slide go to another <clears throat> vehicle manufacturer, which is uh, Toyota. <clears throat> they invested 2.6 billion Rand in building a hybrid car in South Africa uh, and uh, uh, 2,600 jobs were sustained, a number of new jobs created, just over 300. And uh, there's a large number of parts that are localized, that are produced here in South Africa, uh, more than 600 localized parts. And there are 56 local parts suppliers uh, operating in South Africa, and 16 of them are black owned. Um, and on the right hand side, on the members will recall that Toyota launched the Corolla Cross in uh, its plant in Etiquini in October last year, with the value uh, of the investment being set out. Uh, the next slide then goes into another part of the auto value chain. And this is now special economic zones. And here we highlight the work of the Swanee Automotive SEZ. Uh, and three new factories were opened in the Swanee SEZ in the financial year, 600 production workers employed. And there's a number of <clears throat> additional firms uh, who are building uh, <clears throat> the facilities in the SEZ, uh, and some of the details are, uh, are set out there. And we will be reporting again on this in the current financial year as more of those factories get to be uh, ready for, for production. And it really is creating quite a significant auto hub where you have the Ford Motor Company just outside the SEZ and then some of its suppliers inside the SEZ. The next slide. This now looks beyond master plans and <clears throat> we look here at matters involving local capacity, trade and so on. And we've had rapid growth in exports of high tech products like pharmaceuticals and trucks with export of trucks crossing the 4 billion US dollar threshold for the first calendar year on record. We took the 12 month period ending December. Uh, Aspen Pharmacare, which is a South African company with global operations, they exceeded their own target for vaccine production. And uh, the first, and uh, Africa's first anesthetic plant was opened in uh, Tebeja, enabling local hospitals and patients across the world to be serviced by proudly South African made products. As, as I um, <coughs> reported previously, Afrexim Bank also hosted the Africa Trade and Investment um, uh, fair, it's called the Intra-Africa Trade Fair. It was held in Durban, and Afrixim Bank reported that four billion dollars uh, worth of uh, trade and investment deals were uh, concluded by a number of different African countries with their banks, with suppliers, and others. And uh, the department, of course, did quite a bit of work to help with the uh, the uh, trade fair. The department contributed to finalizing rules of origin for products under the African continental free trade area. An agreement was reached on the rules of origin for about 88% of products on the tariff books with more than 4,500 products. Uh, and uh, we, we met the target set in the previous year. And the team um, uh, of uh, Xavier Karim and Nikki Cray and others uh, uh, had to do quite a lot of work because each of these tariff items lines are themselves capable of extensive discussion to see what should be the appropriate rule of origin. The next slide then goes into the uh, details uh, that uh, uh, we, we've uh, provided uh, uh, in the annual report and it covers uh, the uh, equity equivalent investment program. This is a special program that's available to, um, uh, to multinational corporations who can't have equity by Black South Africans in their firms. And JP Morgan, which is a large global investment bank, entered into such an agreement with the department that helped to unlock 340 million Rand fund 
and it was launched in the financial year that we're looking at. It supports black owned enterprises and small businesses in a range of areas, in industrial and green uh, sectors, in education, health and digital inclusion, and in the financial services sector. They've already begun to achieve some uh, outcomes. They've got a short term window that's done 39 deals with 37 million rand paid out, 32 permanent jobs created, and we then do a breakdown of where that is. They also have a medium to long term window, seven transactions worth 60 million rand are in the pipeline. They're going through the due diligence stage in this financial year that we're talking about, uh, and um, uh, uh, some of the details. Four of them uh, have been uh, have been covered and and are reported on. Um, can we go to the next slide? We one slide behind. There we are, and um, uh, four of these um, uh, projects. Okay, uh, so if we can just go one back. <clears throat> Four of these are in construction, in manufacturing, two are in financial sector, and one is in retail. Five million rand has already been paid out. So this has moved quite quickly if we take into account that the, um, the fund was only launched in August. Um, and uh, we'll see there also reference to a, a Black-owned company in Katlihong uh, that is expected to create 23 new jobs. Let's move then to the next slide. The next slide uh, provides uh, additional information on the competition area, because together with transformation of the economy has to go to dealing with some of the structural challenges we face. And one of the highlights I want to point to is the Competition Commission published a report in uh, November, late November, early December last year. Uh, it's a report on measuring concentration and participation in the South African economy. And it's one of the most significant public documents released in the past 12 months. The report is what I could describe a who's who. Uh, who owns the South African economy? Who owns the firm that produce what you eat, where you shop, where you go for your medicines, your blood tests, your x-rays, what you read, what you drink or smoke, where you gamble, where you, uh, what you drive who you fly with, the pipes for the water we use, the renewable energy, the coal, your insurance, your retirement fund, your medical aid, and who you bank with. The study uh, looked at 144 subsectors of the economy, and over two thirds were found to be highly concentrated, 21% were moderately, moderately concentrated, <clears throat> and less than 10% at unconcentrated markets. And we provide a little bit more details there, and what the uh, report concluded is that the provisions that Parliament has enacted in the changes to the competition laws were very, very timely because they will help to address the challenges that this board, uh, this um, uh, report rather, uh, has uh, identified. The next uh, slide uh, provides information on <clears throat> the uh, persistence of level of concentration, uh, and yeah, you, uh, honorable members will see the different quadrants, uh, and uh, we've highlighted in particular uh, the the instances where uh, a, you have a highly concentrated uh, market with a, a dominant firm and a highly concentrated market, <clears throat> but with no uh, presumptively dominant firm. <clears throat> the next slide. This highlights other competition uh, uh, work in cartels. 14 cases were investigated and referred for prosecution. Now, the commission had uh, looked at more cases than the 14, but these were ones where they found in their view that there were grounds for prosecution. So these were very, very careful uh, work that the uh, commission has done. They include firms involved in areas like tourism, defense equipment, vehicle finance, telecom equipment, and earth moving machinery. And addressing cartels is central to efforts to ensure that we have competition in a market that 
parties don't collude. And each of these investigations take an enormous amount of time and effort and expertise because there are lawyers that will be carefully picking through these when we get to the stage of uh, prosecution. Three cases on abuse of dominance were completed uh, in this period. <clears throat> one dealt with Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, another one on cancer drugs, and a third one on school uniforms. <clears throat> and these investigations address the abuse of market power with firms where some of the firms have significant market share in a sector or in a product line. We give one example, which is on the next slide. And that example is on um, cancer, cancer drugs. It involves uh, one firm and the Competition Commission, that's the CC, conducted an investigation for alleged excessive pricing relating to the sale and supply of a particular cancer drug, which is a first line treatment, a life-saving drug, which stops the development of an aggressive type of breast cancer. And um, uh, it, it helps to stop the development of the tumor cells uh, to prevent uh, the cancer from spreading. The commission's investigation revealed that approximately 50% of the total number of newly infected patients were unable to receive treatment due to excessive pricing charged for the medicine. So the impact of excessive pricing affects women, particularly poor women who can't afford to access uh, essential treatment. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes even women who belong to a medical scheme will find that the limits uh, on, uh, on uh, cover uh, uh, yeah, uh, discourages the use of life-saving medication. And the commission's finding uh, said that uh, <clears throat> not only was there uh, prohibited conduct under the Competition Act, but in the view of the commission, it also infringed on several constitutional rights of South African citizens. And the matter has now been referred to the Competition Tribunal. The next slide highlights uh, the work that has been done uh, on mergers. There were about um, 53 mergers that the department looked at from a much wider pool of mergers, and we'll provide the information uh, in the presentation. But six of these were seen to be particularly significant public interest outcomes. And um, uh, just looking at a few of these, um, four of these, uh, three plus Air Liquide, uh, Consul, uh, among others, there was a commitment to significant increased investment that can expand South Africa's capability to produce glass bottles, and it will result in significant import replacement, um, and it's helped to create uh, close to 300 jobs in just one of the two projects that Consul is uh, committed to. Burger King, the agreement included protection for existing workers, and commitments to open new stores and create uh, some 1,200 new jobs. Imperial Logistics committed to capital spending in South Africa over a four-year period, employment commitments they made, and procurement from uh, SMMEs, women-owned businesses, and so on. Early Kid gave a number of localization commitments, particularly also to work with government on uh, green industry opportunities and um, on jobs. In these and other projects, we, we focused on worker ownership provisions, and these were negotiated in some of the significant mergers. And just to look at some of it, the next slide provides two kinds of case studies. On the left-hand side is worker ownership. And this new focus on inclusive growth saw work undertaken that result in settlement agreements with Burger King and Imperial Logistics covering about 30,000 workers who will secure shares in the firms that they work for. And we, we did quite a bit of work in this financial year that we're looking at now on an agreement with ShopRite. It was signed a month after the reporting period, uh, quite significant, we'll come back to it. It's going through the final stages of the competition uh, process. Uh, and um, as I've indicated in the budget speech uh, earlier this year, the, the number of workers with shares in the companies that they own is now becoming uh, fairly significant. 
On the right hand side, we give a different kind of example. This is an example uh, of promoting efforts and empowerment beyond our traditional industrial sectors. So there's a company called Global Credit Rating, and they were acquired by Moody's, uh, Moody's, the credit uh, rating agency. And um, as part of the engagements uh, that, that Moody had with uh, both the department and the uh, competition authorities, they um, uh, agreed that a 20% of equity would be, would be held by uh, Black South Africans. And this was held now by Afri the, an organization of African women chartered accountants who have their own investment holding uh, company. And it gives uh, female chartered accountants uh, a, a stake in quite a significant company in the financial sector. All of this was negotiated and finalized during the financial year, but the signing ceremony itself was on the 1st of April, which is the start of the new financial year. The next slide then goes into the <clears throat> uh, examples of trade policy. And trade instruments can be used to support domestic industries by leveling the playing fields with imports uh, and by uh, increasing the competitiveness of firms. So there are different tools in the, in the toolbox. Some of them are tariff adjustments where our rates are lower than that, uh, that we bound ourselves to in the World Trade Organization. And we've got policy space to increase it up to the, the level that we're committed at the World Trade Organization. And uh, countries do this regularly. And so we implemented five uh, uh, tariff adjustments. Uh, these tariff adjustments were in products like tin plate cans, pails and aerosol cans, steel tubes and pipes, chrome grinding balls, foot operated grease guns, and safety headgear. But then we also have something called the duty rebate. The duty rebate is where you bring the tariffs down and you bring it down particularly where you want to lower the cost of an input where there's a lot of opportunity to expand your downstream sector and uh, you don't have a significant industrial interest upstream. So <clears throat> we reduce duties through a duty rebate on warp knit fabrics for upholstered furniture <clears throat> and for caustic soda that are used in um, uh, certain kinds of paper. We also implemented uh, a number of trade remedies, one anti-dumping duty on pasta, two safeguard duties on bolt and set screws. Uh, there were also uh, sunset reviews of anti-dumping duties. This is where the period of the anti-dumping duty comes to an end and the authorities, the trade authorities look at whether to extend it based on the information at their disposal. And uh, some of these were put in place on wheelbarrows, on stainless steel things, on garlic and on frozen bone-in chicken. Three provisional anti-dumping duties were also put in place on laminated safety glass, on uh, uh, clear float uh, glass and on uh, frozen bone-in chickens. We've worked with companies to say, look, long-term, trying to only rely on tariff protection is not a good strategy. We've got to increase the competitiveness of South African businesses. And one of the driver of competitiveness is investment. When a company gets a tariff increase and it relaxes, it's not modernizing its operations. It's not investing in new uh, equipment and machinery. Then it becomes even less competitive. So for us, the sweet spot is to try to get both of those done simultaneously. So we've had commitments to increase investment by a number of firms uh, through the, the, uh, the measures that uh, ITAC has recommended. And um, the uh, ITAC uh, has reported that more than 25,000 workers were covered by firms who uh, uh, have directly uh, benefited from the trade measures. Uh, they believe the figure could even be higher, but uh, they've put uh, that number forward as the minimum uh, support uh, for, for the uh, trade measures that were, were, uh, were granted. So this again illustrates the service delivery impact of our work. 
So while a trade measure, we measure, has there been a tariff uh, increase? Has there been a anti-dumping duty? Has there been a reduction in uh, tariffs on inputs through a rebate? But seeing what the impact is has not been what the department traditionally did. And in the 2021, 22 financial year, uh, I have requested that more of that come out, but it's a particular focus on this new financial year that we're in. Slide 27 covers beneficiation, some of the work done on minerals by the IDC projects that will uh, help to um, uh, promote uh, mineral uh, uh, development in high-tech batteries. Um, and uh, some of the examples are given there work uh, that on the furniture industry that can use more South African trees and work in the clothing industry that can support local cotton farmers. The next slide uh, will provide the committee with um, information on a few highlights across the portfolio. We've tried not to cover uh, all of them just to give a, a, a little flavor. So for example, the CIPC that's uh, 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 reported that 469,983, I think I can call it 470,000 new companies were registered with the CIPC within a day. And uh, that, of course, in, uh, uh, requires that the CIPC, one of our entities, has a proper system technology platform in place that just eases the do, uh, the um doing business in South Africa. Then 28,600 um, uh, debt rearrangement matters were finalized uh, by one of our entities, the NCT, uh, that uh, assisted uh, highly indebted uh, uh, consumers. 414 technical standards were published by SABS. And about a third of those were technical standards that were developed here in South Africa. The other two thirds were global standards that uh, uh, SABS worked through and then published. And then um, seven is the number, the number of years since the NRCS last had an unqualified audit report. And as the Auditor General uh, reported earlier, this year the NRCS achieved an unqualified audit report. The next slide uh, then provides the committee with uh, some uh, uh, information on action against corruption. During the past year, steps were taken to clean up the National Lotteries Commission, which had been under a cloud of corruption, nepotism, and secrecy for a period stretching back over a number of years. Uh, and uh, we provided a detailed report to the Portfolio Committee on the work that had been done here. So just a few highlights that I can point to that the board was replaced by a team of South Africans with strong governance records that um, we wrote to the Auditor General's office last year to bring to the Auditor General's uh, attention a number of concerns uh, that had arisen from uh, the forensics, that the uh, SIU provided its first reports in the financial year, the disciplinary steps were initiated against implicated board members. And it's in this financial year also that the Gauteng High Court affirmed the right of the executive authority to initiate a forensic investigation, which in turn contributed to the work of the SIU uh, that was set up to probe maladministration in the NLC. If we go to the next slide, uh, it just highlights some of the work on economic recovery that we have reported on, the work of the DTIC, the IDC, and the NEF, uh, three billion rands worth of approvals were finalized uh, in uh, this period. Uh, over 2,000 firms were supported in one or other way, and more than 38,000 jobs were covered uh, by the support program. So these were the number of people employed by companies that received uh, some support from the DTIC group. The next slide um, really uh, just uh, seeks to uh, uh, introduce the economic context of our work, the global economic outlook, 
the global economy uh, is projected to grow by 3.2% this year and 2.9% in 2023. This is a downward revision. Um, so the IMF has brought down its projection of growth given some of the risks. We'll be looking now for the, the latest data that um, uh, will, be, will be available uh, shortly on the projections. But some of the risks are highlighted in um, those three bullets uh, on that slide. The, um, the war in Ukraine that has disrupted grain and energy markets. Uh, the economic costs of the war are expected to spread further through commodity markets, through trade, and through financial interlinkages. We're seeing now global monetary policy tightening due to rising inflation across both developing and developed economies. Fuel and food price rises. We've seen that, which already having a global impact and I expect it to continue to have a negative economic impact on vulnerable populations, uh, particularly in low income countries, but also low income consumers in uh, middle income uh, and high income countries. We're seeing lingering COVID-19 effects in China and the rising monkeypox uh, infections. The next slide uh, then provides a little bit more information on the economic overview. Uh, it makes the point that the South African economy began to recover from the first wave of COVID-19. It grew 2.7% during the reporting period, and our GDP uh, was valued just over uh, 6 trillion rand in 2021 prices. Manufacturing exports were the highest in at least a decade. The agriculture and parts of the auto value chains had the best export performance yet. Uh, Africa opened its first anesthetic production facility in the same year that we saw pharmaceutical exports reach record levels and they crossed the $1 billion threshold. Some of this were linked to um, the COVID-19 uh, products that we had spent quite a bit of work in 2020 uh, supporting and promoting. The next slide. Uh, the slide makes the point that despite progress, the economy and ordinary South Africans still face many and great challenges. Some of them are persistent challenges and some are new challenges. Unemployment, open unemployment, meaning people looking for work stood at 7.8 million persons. And we had an additional 3.7 million discouraged work seekers. The growth rate, the economic growth rate, Yes, it's affected by energy and logistics challenges, but it is below the levels required to boost broader development in a sustainable way. The past two years have also highlighted the risks that the economy faces that require the department to develop a better way of de-risking the economy so we protect the livelihoods of all South Africans to build forward better. The next slide provides more information. It gives some information on the domestic uh, economic context in the financial year under review. The team has extracted the information to show that growth was driven by six sectors, particularly high growth in transport and personal services. Uh, manufacturing grew by 1.1% and generated 744 billion rand in value add. Uh, and that growth was weighed down by declines in construction in agriculture in this period, then manufacturing exports amounted to about 520 billion rand for the financial year, accounting for 27% of our export basket. And growth forecast for the current calendar year is 1.9% and for next year, 1.4%. Of course, these will um, keep on being revised on the basis of new information. Challenges since the start of the reporting period, uh, three new shocks or headwinds that impacted on the economy. First, the July 2021 unrest in KZ in parts of Gauteng that led to loss of life and the destruction of infrastructure, it dented business conf uh, confidence, and yes, it disrupted supply chains. The second one was the war in Ukraine that resulted in fuel price increases and rising costs of fertilizers, wheat, edible oils, and other foodstuffs. Now, those two were in the financial year. We've, just for the completeness of, of, of reporting, we, we point out the 
floods on our eastern sea seaboard in April. Uh, at the end of the reporting period, led to loss of life and washed away homes, shops, factory assets, and railway lines. And it does remind us on the cost of climate change. The next slide. Some lessons. Three standout lessons from the new shocks, which reinforce what we've learned from the systemic challenge of climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've gone through a period of extraordinary external crisis, uh, and, and we're trying to learn some, some lessons from it. The first lesson is that economies and supply chains are vulnerable, and that building greater industrial resilience need even greater prominence in our policymakers. So while policymakers across the world have looked in the past only at the growth rate, more and more they are looking at how to build an economy that is more resilient, that can absorb these punches, these challenges without causing uh, very, very significant harm in a society. The second lesson is that societies need a capable state a state that's responsive and agile, must be able to move quickly and equipped to, to, to marshal what is needed when a risk materializes. Because we've, we work on the um, uh, medium-term strategic framework and annual performance plans, very often the, the government um, system is designed on a, a very thorough process of planning, getting everybody on the same page, allocating budgets, then beginning slowly to roll out services. And these typically get planned way in advance of a financial year. But what do we do in a world where things are moving much faster? Our systems really are not designed for that. And so part of what we need to do is while we recognize the need to work within the ambit of the Public Finance Management Act and all the staffing and other regulations that we have in place and all the, um, the, the uh, uh, regulatory requirements. The truth is that in a fast changing world, we need more agility. And that's really a very important lesson that we've learned from this period. The third lesson is that the absence of economic justice place the burden of climate change, of social uh, disruption and of geopolitical tensions and disruptions on those in society that can least afford to shoulder those burdens. And therefore a big part of our job, much as we're seeking to deal with the, the technical economic challenge, we also need to promote a broader economic justice um, agenda and ensure that there's fairness in the economy that there's transformation, that there's an opportunity for small business, that more South Africans are in sustainable work. Those are all quite, quite critical. So these were some of the lessons. Uh, honorable members, the next part of the report, which will start on the next slide, is the annual performance summary, looking specifically now at the annual report that was tabled and the work of the DTIC and its 10, uh, and its 10, um, programs or branches as they are sometimes called. And uh, Chair, with your permission, I'm going to ask um, if uh, the Director General can take the Portfolio Committee through it. The DG can move with a little bit of speed given that the, the document has all the, the detail in it and has been uh, circulated, the annual report itself to members of the committee. But this presentation does help to summarize and show the overall trends. So I'm going to ask uh, Shabir Khan, uh, through you, Chairperson, uh, to take the floor. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Thank you, uh, Minister. Greetings, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee, um, officials from the Auditor General, um, colleagues from the DTIC. Chair, the, the first slide um, on part B really sets out the, or provides a snapshot of the performance over, or since the start of the administration. 
um, as members of the committee would know, the first year was a year in which both the DTI and EDD had separate annual reports. And the right-hand side of the slide really sets out the performance in that first year. In the 2020-2021 financial year, that was the first year in which both the former departments were consolidated. And of the 35 um, indicators and target in, in that year, 33 were achieved and two were not achieved. In the um, current reporting period, we do have 73 um, targets and of the 73 targets, 66 were achieved and seven were not achieved. The next slide really sets out the, or provides a high level summary of the 10 programs and the KPIs across the 10 programs together with the targets and the achievement across the entire department. The next slide sets out the seven targets that were not achieved. I'll start with the first one, which was an internal capacity building uh, target, which was not achieved primarily due to change in business requirements within the department. The review of the governance framework has been shifted to this or to the following financial year. Of the two master plans that were targeted in the last financial year, the global business services was finalized and launched whilst consultations on a further master plan were still underway. With regard to the product designations on building materials, the minister requested public consultation before publication, and this was not completed at the end of that reporting period. Under program six, which is the industrial financing branch, um, there was an action report detailing partnerships with, with private, private sector entities. And these activities were not signed off um, uh, within the reporting period. With regard to a, a specific target of, of, of statistical reports on companies' registrations from CIPC, one of the reports did not contain the required information on companies' registration within one day. And lastly, a report on active pharmaceutical ingredients. Um, that study, which was due in quarter four, was not produced due to non-compliance issues identified as part of the supply chain process. Next slide. Chair, um, this one is really starting on program one. Very quickly, um, all eligible credit payments were processed within 30 days. The target or on people and persons with disabilities was met as at, at the end of 31st March, 2022. 54% of women in SMS um, positions were employed at the end of the reporting period, which was well above the annual target of 50%. 54 interns were, appoint, were appointed against a target of 54. And the last two bullets really captures the work that we've done under the shared services. The first one was in the ICT space in which we provided uh, continued best practice frameworks across the portfolio. And the second one is really the strengthening the forensic arm of the department to really capacitate and provide um, forensic capabilities to the, to the rest of the portfolio. The next one is, next slide, captures the work in program two, which is the, largely the trade work, starting with the South Africa's chairship of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Institutions, as well as SACO. And here, um, the committees on investment, competition policy, digital trade, as well as women and youth in trade were established. Um, we started negotiation on the AFCF CFTA rules on the protocol on intellectual property, investment and competition policy. The dispute settlement body and appellate body was established. And we've also agreed on rules of origin, which determine African content in our trade on 87.7% of all products. The SACU tariff offer to the Africa Continental Free Trade Area Agreement improved to 7,045 tariff lines. We've also established committees on industrialization, 
export promotion and investment promotion to try to consolidate value chains and investment in SACO and establish SACO as a base for global exports. And the South African chairship of the AFCFTA institution extended to July 2022. And South Africa also concluded its term as chair of SACO. The next slide captures the work that we're doing in, um, multi, in, in, um, in multilateral flora, multilateral fora. The first one starts um, around the work that we did in March 2022, uh, in which South Africa's participation and interventions at the first G20 um, Trade Industrialization and Investment Working Group under the Indonesian presidency. Uh, similarly, we also led South Africa's participation and interventions at the first BRICS contact, contact group on economics and trade issues uh, meeting, which was under the Chinese presidency. As previously reported at the WTO, we focused on advancing an outcome on the TRIPS waiver, which ensured that the IP rights do not unduly hinder access to medicines and medical technologies, thus enabling diversification of global pharmaceutical supply chains. There was also a lot of technical work done on the various proposed outcomes for the WTO ministerial, which was postponed from December 2021 to June 2022. And we've also led South Africa's delegation and provide substantive inputs in submissions made on behalf of SACO at the arbitration hearing between SACO and the EU in regard to safe um, guard measures taken on EU poultry imports under the SADC EU um, Economic Part Partnership Agreement. Um, we're also delighted to report that Roibos was added to the EU Register of Products with protection, with protected designation of origin, becoming the first product in Africa to receive the status and the 40th non EU product. And the first draft of the trademarks. Amendment bills were submitted to the chief state, chief state law advisor for pre-certification. The next slide captures the work done within the USA market um, during the AGOBA ministerial, which was held in October last year. The African ministers of trade with concurrence of the United States administration agreed that South Africa will host the next AGOBA forum in 2023. South Africa, what its African partners will seek to encourage the US to extend a GOA beyond its 2025 expiry date, which will also seek to improve conditions of access and ensure that benefits of a GOA continue. Sub-Saharan African countries also call for US support to Africa's industrialization and integration efforts, including the AFCFTA, and encourage increased US investment in manufacturing and infrastructure across the continent. In, in the Chinese market, the establishment of a quick response team was put in place, which sought to deal with, quite speedily with resolutions to bilateral trade concerns, such as customs clearance, illegal imports, and the suspension of certain products in the Chinese market due to COVID-19 restrictions. Following one year of South Africa's inability to sell oysters to China, South African oysters are now allowed to enter the uh, Chinese market in August, 2021. The next slide moves into the next program, which is the spatial industrial development. This slide provides a, a, a snapshot overview or a ge geographical overview of the 10 designated SEZs. And to date we have 170 operational investments in the 10 designated SEZs, as well as investments to the value of 20.9 billion, as well as 19,300 jobs that we created. Quickly moving to some of the investments in the different areas. The next slide starts off with the Richards Bay Industrial Development Zone. Here we've seen the construction of a technical service center for Niaza light metals um, for the titanium diox dioxide plant which is valued at 130 million rand. Furthermore, we saw within the Ulma processing plant um, in, in, in the IDZ, um, the um, an important 385 construction jobs have been created on the construction of the 1.1 billion rand edible oils 
plant. We also saw on the Love More Bros facility, which has been certified as a bonded facility by SARS. And this expansion has led to Love More, Love More Bros spending an additional 9 million rand on equipment for the new bonded warehouse. And lastly, ProStar Paints, a manufacturer of paints, decorative, protective, and industrial coating is also expected to start construction in the new financial year, following the approval of the 40, 54 million rand top structure. And this project is valued at 141 million rand. The next slide sets out the work at the Dubai Trade Port Special Economic Zone. We've seen here 161 million rand private sector investment that has been leveraged during the year. We've also seen two lease agreements which have been signed by Synergy Blenders as well as Alum Diapers. We've also some, seen some work around Trade Zone 2 where bulk infrastructure valued at an estimated value of 160 million, 106 million rand, which has been completed. Within the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone, we saw three investment pledges, which were made at the 40, uh, SA Investment Conference. They are Cape Oceans Terminals, Ankara, and a new investment called Africa Ports, which is a solar energy manufacturing plant for the South African and African markets. The next slide is the work done at the Shwane Special Economic Zone. I think the minister captured this in his earlier um, slides, so I wouldn't go into any detail on that one. But on the East London Industrial Development Zone, we've seen new facilities being completed for Mercedes-Benz, um, Aurea, Ebo, Polytech, Value Draga, and all these are in the automotive space as well as Bushveld, which is in the renewable energy space. The next slide. The next slide sets out the works, the work that we've done in the industrial parks area. Here we've seen a number of security upgrades and building refurbishments on four industrial parks being Dumbaza, Komani, Pochabello, and, and Wulindlela. We've also seen some construction and refurbishment on four industrial parks. Similarly, we saw some phase two factory refurbishments of Sesejo, um, the Sesejo Industrial Park, uh, which we initiated, as well as phase one of security and bulk infrastructure for the Uppington um, Industrial Park. We've also seen applications submitted to the fund for phase two factory refurbishment for three industrial parks and phase one security upgrades for two industrial parks. We've also seen some work at the Pozzobello Digital Hub, which, is, which has been constructed and is operational. And we've seen this has been attended to over 2,000 youth, including 130 youth receiving ICT-related training. We've also seen a 2 billion rand total investment increase um, over a 12-month period, um, which we've seen investments increase from 4 billion rand to 6 billion rand over this reporting period. The next slide further emphasizes this point. Here we can see the, um, the industrial parks across the seven provinces, and these total 13 um, industrial parks. Um, we've, within these 13 industrial parks, there's 1,141 tenants, over 48,000 people employed across these um, 13 industrial parks and total investments of, of 6 billion rand across these industrial parks. The next slide. The next slide moves into program four, which is our sector branch that deals with the master plans. Um, I think um, the committee is familiar with the work um, that we're doing in this, in this area. And literally, it's, it's, it's the work in this area is central to the social compact between government, industry, and organized labor. The next slide sets out some of the key achievements in some of in, in the different sectors, starting with the furniture industry. We've seen the FX group announcing its support uh, towards the expansion of board manufacturing. We've also facilitated access to markets for 10 design or manufacturing companies in the furniture sector. And we also collaborated with Plowry Essay 
in which a furniture portal was launched to promote furniture localization. Within the sugar industry, reciprocal commitments and agreements were adhered to by all stakeholders. And here, really, we are referring to the commitments by business as well as labor and, and the government. We've also seen a partnership with ShopRite, in which the SA cane growers, with the SA cane growers, on prioritizing the selling of locally produced sugar in its 1,189 stores. And we've also seen a 15% growth in local sales. On the poultry industry, um, we've seen the South African poultry industry pledging um, an amount of 1.5 billion rand by the end of 20, or they have pledged an amount of 1.5 billion rand by the end of 2022. And by the end of November, 2021, the poultry industry has already invested 1.14 billion rand and created 9.8% additional capacity for emerging farmers. The industry also has invested in creating 120 tons of additional cooking capacity per week. And the Animal Feed Manufacturers Association has reported an additional 2,000 jobs being created in the extended value chain. The next slide captures the work done in the metal fabrication, fabrication, capital and rail transport equipment sector. And here we are reporting that the minister, along with industry stakeholders from the steel and metal fabrication sector signed a master plan, which has been developed in consultation with all stakeholders um, from industry in June, 2021, and implementation is underway. Within this scrap metal intervention, um, here we are reporting the work done within the reporting period. Here, the, an export duty on scrap metals was introduced in the period, and through the ITER Act, price preference system was extended to 31st July, 2023. The two instruments implemented concurrently ensures adequate quality of scrap metal is available at competitive pricing for local processing by steel mills, secondary smelters and foundries. And these measures will contribute towards local beneficiation of scrap metals and restore, restore supply chain stability in the, in the industry. In the textiles, clothing, leather and footwear, here we're looking at um, some of the, um, uh, an, an investment in Garankua uh, by Beida SA with 800 employees and, and an investment of 300 million in additional capacity to manufacture automotive leather and split leather. And we've seen another um, investor, uh, Neptune's Boots, in which they invested in additional production of 2,500 pairs of gum boots uh, a month. The next one is in the plastic sector, in which we've seen a number of investments here. The first one being Caesar Bantu piping systems with an investment of 70 million rand. Another investment by Cospac, located in the Western Cape, made an investment of 3 million rand. And we've also seen a, a, a further investment of 2 million rand, which was, which, which was introduced um, for the trigger spray pump. Another investment by Very Green, located in Pinetown, uh, which was pledged of around 2 million rand. And lastly, Hoop, located in Cape Town, invested 5 million rand, million rand to put up tool, tooling using local engineering firm and license production to locally manufacture and to make uh, vaccine thermal cooler boxes. Within the pharmaceutical and medical devices sector, um, here, in response to the inequality of, of access to COVID-19 vaccines in developing countries, and in particular Africa, AFRIGEN, the BioVac Institute, the South African Medical Research Council, Council, and a network of local industries were appointed by the World Health, World Health Organization in 2021 to establish its first MR, R, mRNA um, vaccine technology development and transfer hub. And it is a global initiative to enable sustainability, locally owned mRNA manufacturing capabilities in lower middle income countries, contributing to future pandemic preparedness. The next slide further uh, 
outline the work um, in, in this sector. Here we are uh, reporting in the, in the big investment by Aspen, which was a 3.4 billion investment that was announced in 2018. And this enabled the conclusion of a contract manufacturing agreement between Aspen and j, &J for the production of the first choice COVID vaccine for the continent. And it also enabled the conclusion of a license agreement for the product Aspenovax, the Aspen COVID-19 vaccine product between Aspen and j, &J. To date, Aspen produced 225 million doses of the j, &J vaccine over the past 17 month, months, making it the largest j, &J contract manufacturer of the j, &J con, um, COVID vaccine. And this has created a number of jobs and, of course, absorbed a number of existing jobs. Um, as the bulk of this investment was already contained in the 3.4 billion rand investment, the pivoting uh, towards uh, vaccine contract production required minimal investment by Aspen. Um, furthermore, new investments to expand vaccine production medium to long term will come into being in the context of the Serum Institute agreement recently signed between Aspen and the Serum Institute. We also seen Africa's first anesthetic plant was opened in October 2021 to produce proper full product for South Africa and global markets. Uh, in the cosmetic sector here, the um, department facilitated an accreditation program jointly with SABS where we've seen Johnson's Baby um, South Africa was SABS certified, um, for, uh, which means that the sanitary pads and baby diapers products will now carry the SABS approved mark. And this is the first company in Africa to get, to get this certification. In the green industry sector, we've seen some investments in the PV, solar PV manufacturing space. Um, namely um, two plants called Seraphim and Art Solar with an investment value of 500 million rand. We've also seen the publication of the green paper on electric vehicles for public uh, comment. In aerospace and defense, 149 highly skilled jobs were created through the Aerospace Industry Support Initiative and 20 SMMEs directly supported for technology enhancement as well as standards and accreditation. The next slide sets out the work that we're doing within the consumer and corporate regulation branch. Here is the work done on a number of bills, starting off with the company's amendment bill, which was public for pu public comment in October 2021. And the review of these public comments was underway by the end of the financial year. The liquor amendment bill is under also under review. And during the year, there was a large number of interdepartmental interdepartmental engagements on government, government measures and approach to liquor abuse. And the lottery's regulatory impact assessment was finalized and the recommendations will inform proposed legislative changes, as well as the branch reviewed the Special Economic Zones Act and policy to identify issues for possible consideration going forward. The next slide moves on to our industrial financing branch. And within this year, um, Chair, we've seen a number, we've seen four, four billion rand dispersed, uh, a drawdown of 784 million rand by, uh, from the 12i tax incentive program. And this leveraged 22 billion rand in, in, in investments um, um, by supported companies. And these supported companies have procured 135 billion rand from domestic suppliers. So this is really showing the complete value chain of the impact of the work um, in this area. We've also seen increased intra-Africa trade to, supported, uh, to support um, some of the work done on the continent. And these supported companies have exported 8 billion rand across various African uh, countries. We've also seen a number of investments that were approved, which will result in investments of 28 billion rand. Um, also a large number of investments in the automotive space with um, a projected investments of 12 billion rand. And these projected investments will result in approximately 60,000 
direct jobs which will be supported. In terms of the spatial footprint of the support, uh, 32 of the 52 municipalities were uh, supported. In terms of our transformation um, uh, uh, objectives, 79% uh, of beneficiaries which were paid are, are BEE levels one to four, 75% have uh, were black owned projects, 31% were women owned projects, as well as 12% um, were youth owned uh, projects. We've also seen some, in, some integration work between the department, IDC and NEF, in which they are collaborating on a industrial financing web portal. And lastly, we've seen some green energy initiatives by initiative, uh, initiatives, and these were funded uh, projects um, to include solar panels, as well as the in installation of energy efficient equipment and the storage of rainwater. The next slide really outlines the work in a bit more detail around some of the um, work on, which I've outlined on the previous slide, but, but importantly to highlight that um, the critical infrastructure reconstruction program uh, which was deployed during the July unrest, supported a number of investments and, and also um, um, helped uh, rebuild some of the, the um, building that were destroyed during the unrest. Um, we've also seen some um, improvement in some of the guidelines which allowed for virtual events and we, We've also seen 100% of, of grant funding for women, youth, and persons with disabilities, which was which were some of the amendments to the guidelines. The critical infrastructure program also made some improvements, uh, approvals for newly designated um, industrial parks. And we've also seen the critical infrastructure program, uh, which was implemented during the quarter, resulted in 12 conditional approvals. Um, the changes to the EMEA guidelines also enabled some digital events which supported um, a large number of companies, um, more importantly, women, youth, and persons with disabilities. And all of these interventions contributed to growing the country's economy, developing skills, and creating opportunities, thus ad addressing the challenge of unemployment in the country. The next slide is our export branch. And here we are detailing, detailing some of the work which we have done during the, that period or the reporting period, starting off with some of the work done um, in Africa. Here, yeah, a big part of the work in, in that financial year was the support of the Intra-Africa Trade Fair, in which we reported, um, which, which we report that a large number of South African companies were supported. And um, 262 business meetings were held, and this led to 2,565 trade leads, around 1.4 million rand in export sales generated at the fair, as well as the Intra-Africa Trade Fair as a whole generating $42.1 billion in trade and investment deals across the countries. We also report um, um, the work done on a number of business forums, uh, for Cordova, Ghana, and Nigeria, which culminated in a pipeline um, of, um, of $1.6 billion of projects between uh, Ghana and South Africa. We also organized the South Africa Kenya Business Forum, which saw the signing of an MOU between Kenyan Airways and SAA. We also facilitated a South African company called Flowtight to secure in Zimbabwe, the manufacture and supply of glass reinforced pipes uh, to the national Matebeleland Sambezi water phase one and two, which is valued at $100 million. The next slide captures the work done um, um, around across the world. A year we supported a Kuwaiti owned company which is based in Eastern Cape um, to overcome some export challenges uh, of sheep and goats to Kuwait. And through this unblocking, we saw 57,000 sheep um, as well as 170 goats and 800 
cattle being exported. We also facilitated engagement with port officials and the Lulu Group from the United Arab Emirates to discuss challenges faced by the company at the Cape Town port uh, when exporting. We've also seen a virtual retail induction session was held with senior buyers from the Lulu Group um, in the Cape Town office, focusing on a number of sectors and 46 African companies uh, profiled their products with Lulu's, with Lulu's exploring sourcing possibilities with um, two companies and the minister visited Lulu as well. We also facilitated the export of beef uh, for the company QK Meats to China. And QK Meats is a BEE company and one of the largest meat processing plants um, that needed to be re-audited by Chinese authorities. And through the, uh, the work between the department and Delrad, um, the uh, company managed to get uh, re-audited and continue exports into the Chinese market. The next slide uh, continues with the work done. Here yeah, we've seen a, an agreement signed between Nexa, Nexa and the uh, Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute. Um, we've also seen a matchmaking session between a Swedish buyer and a South African company um, called Kapadim. Um, we've also seen, we also facilitated the Guinness Funds Group, which is a UK distributor distributor of macadamia um, with an annual volume of 160, 126 containers, linking up the Green Farms Nut Company located in the in Pumalanga province. We've also concluded an MOU between the DTIC and SIPO, which formed the basis of collaboration between the two parties for future export promotion activities. The next slide sets up the work which we've done at the Dubai Expo. In here, um, once again, we're highlighting that the Dubai Expo served as a showcase to the world of the best of South Africa um, capabilities on offer in terms of trade, investment, tourism, as well as sports and, and arts and culture. In addition to the physical pre uh, presence, there was also a number of offsite activities, as well as a webinar, as well as virtual exhibitions and shopping, uh, online shopping platforms. And these platforms allowed more than 100 companies to exhibit, with 36 companies added to the existing membership of Proudly SA. The sector's profile included agriculture, agribusiness, clothing and textiles, automotive, and so on. Although the expo was primarily not a trade show, um, South, Africa particip South Africa's participation generated close to 90 business leads, with early examples of actual returns, including an Emirati company called Velocity Ventures announcing a 250 million investment expansion in South Africa to produce steel coils. Six SMMEs securing 145 million uh, from international invest investors after they were selected to pitch um, to investors using the South African platform. 12 South African artists received a 1 um, million dirham in performance fees from events like in at the expo and the uae based store hyperama selling south african products increased their monthly turnover by 1 million dirhams a um here we also seen a south african company um Roybus company um, receiving a number of orders and also during the event um we've seen a number of orders generated during uh, through the online shopping platform the next slide is large la it's the export development work and here through the exporter development program, we've seen a number of um, individuals being, um, being trained um, through the, uh, to the companies uh, that were trained who attended the export awareness session. 205 individuals went through the intense global exporter program, as well as 65 individuals recruited from the GEP P graduates who went through the mentorship program. And this was really a strategic partnership between the DTIC and the German development agency called GIZ. The next slide moves. Mr. Khan, 
I see you have just under 20 slides left and I think we're going to be running short on time. So if we, you can just uh, gallop through and just highlight the most important information because this presentation has been circulated to members. We want to leave enough time for discussion. Thank you, you may proceed. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I'll move quite rapidly along. Chair, Program 8 is our investment branch uh, called Invest SA. And through the work of Invest SA, they developed a 166, 176 billion rand pipeline. They also co hosted the uh, Port South African Investment Conference. And we've seen a number of um, unblocking work that they've done during the course uh, of, of the uh, work program, which looked at um, visa facilitation, intercompany transfers, as well as critical skills. The next slide, Chair, sets out some of the details of the work done under this program around the unblocking. So we can move on to the next uh, two or three slides, um, which really sets out the, the work done in this area. Under Program 9, which is the competition branch, Chair, um, um, here we report a number of mergers in which the department participated in terms of Section 12A3 of the Competition Act. And during this financial year, the minister was notified of 290 mergers. Of these, the DTIC participated in 53. The next slide sets out some of the mergers in which the DTIC has uh, participated in with significant public interest outcomes. Uh, the first one being console, and minister has already outlined some of these just to highlight some of the big investments coming through as a result of, of these mergers. We've seen um, the 1.5 billion rand investment in the N2 furnace, and a similar investment will be made uh, uh, at the N3 uh, furnace. The next one slide captures the work done between the DP World and Imperial Logistics merger, which was finalized in quarter four. And here, um, the key highlight is um, a ESOP of 5% of South African workers um, as a result of the merger and a 2.1 billion rand CapEx program over the next four years. Um, the one on between ECP Africa and the Burger King merger, here we've seen also an ESOP which was created. And we've also seen an investment of 500 million rand to establish 16 new Burger King stores. Um, Across the, across the country. The next slide um, is really the work done, and the next slide, Sulu, under the Presidential Employment Stimulus. Um, um, this is the work that we've previously reported on. And here, this was a work program that was approved during the adjustment budget process last year. And we really got funding through, um, through the adjustment budget at that point in time. Monies was transferred into IDC in March 2022. We've seen the first disbursements in the current financial year in June. And currently, 44,000 participants are currently enrolled on the system. Program 10 is the research branch. And this slide really sets out the work done in putting the research uh, program. If we can move to the next slide. Um, this slide further. Um, highlights the work done on the import tracker reports, as well as a report on executive pay ratios. And lastly, the quarterly analytical reports that came um, out of this branch. Chair, I'm gonna quickly move on to the part three, the financial performance. Um, next slide. During the financial year, we had a budget of 11.6 billion Rand. And of the 11.6 billion Rand, 1.9 billion Rand went towards the infrastructure programs, namely SEZs and critical infrastructure on the industrial parts program. We've also seen a net asset value in terms of balance sheet of 1.4 billion Rand, as well as a contingent liability of 8.7 billion Rand. And this is really an accounting of how um, the incentive commitments um, that we currently have on book. The next slide sets out the some of the key appropriation statement highlights. 
um, key to highlight is that we started off with a budget of 9.7 billion rand. Um, during there was a special appropriation in which we seen monies that was appropriated for the July July unrest. And lastly, um, we've seen further funds being appropriated as part of the uh, social employment fund. The next slide. The next slide is uh, literally setting out the the budget and, and the expenditure uh, to date. And literally, we've seen 54% um, of the budget going towards largely the incentive programs to really boost investment across the various sectors which we do support. Um, the next slide. The next slide is is the a slide that. Um, you will see uh, quite um, quite extensively in the annual report as well, which really sets out the the financial spending on a program level as well as an economic classification level. And the key thing to highlight is that we had expenditure of 98.3% during the financial year. Uh, very quickly, Chair, um, I'm going to conclude within the next two, two slides, um, literally looking at the audit outcomes. And we've seen already um, um, the, the Auditor General has reported um, in its earlier report. And here just, it just sets out the, the last two financial years, which clearly gives the committee an indication of some of the changes between the audit outcomes um, in, within the DTIC portfolio. The next slide, Chair, really sets out the, the entities um, within the group that receive unqualified, um, an un unqualified outcome with no findings, those who also receive an unqualified with findings, and lastly, the qualification for the National Rogers Commission. Chair, I will conclude on this slide and then hand over back to the minister who will then uh, hand over that to yourself. Thank you so much. Thank you, minister. Any concluding remarks? Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Really just to appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, the uh, report. And may I then hand back to you after thanking also the, uh, the Acting Director General. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think, members, I think we'll have a comfort break now um, of, I think, uh, 10 minutes to be reasonable. And then we'll reconvene at about uh, 5 to 12 so that we have a full hour to um, interrogate the, uh, sorry, to, to, to make inputs on, on the report. So um, see you again at 10 to, sorry, at 5 to 12. And then we'll take hands and um, comments and responses from the AG's office and from the DTIC team led by the minister. Thank you.
confused. Um, I just want to check whether somebody from, I see Mr. Sh uh, Shabalala is on the platform. So I think let us um, continue and take hands from members. Um, can I do that now, please? Members, we'll see by show of hands. Mr. Madamatia, Ms. Mutahum. Yes. Prince Burns Namashe. Yes. Mr. Twing. Any other hands? Those are the hands currently that, that we currently have, Chair. Okay, so let us proceed with those hands at the moment, uh, starting with Honorable Malamacha. No, thank you, Chair. Allow me to, to express, I mean, express my sincere acknowledgement of the two reports of which both were very clear and they were not just a report, we're also showing what was intended and what has happened and what is the mitigation on that. Starting with the first presentation, come from the chairperson, one was very much worried the manner in which the NLC is not making it, and in many cases, by not complying, especially with the PFMA. But one is also happy with the consequences management that has been uh, recommended. So it will be up to us to ensure that the entities, they comply, so that at the end of the day, the good work that has been seen through by other entities doing good after we have been so hard at work to ensure that they do right. It too and SAPs also do the same. I'm saying this because if you go to the issue of SAPs, can't be correct that we we have an entity that does not have a permanent CEO. It means somebody is not taking care of the day-to-day -day work. It can't be correct that we have got an entity which does not have a full-time board. It means people are doing as they wish. These are the things that I've noticed. And by the recommendation are very clear that it must be given a sense of agency to deal with that. The second presentation, Chairperson, very informative, detailed, and uh, with the overall percentage of 98.3 achievement, that also matches the output one is very satisfied and one has this to say that if all the department can up their game and do as this department has done, I think the lost confidence of the South Africans to many departments can easily be gained. I think the department has done well and they made us proud. They must just keep it up. Where there are some findings, I think that must be the target for few months because the very same findings are not that much and there are reasons behind. So we just need to follow those reasons and ensure that <clears throat> those reasons are easily uh, uh, followed. However, after said that there is these few questions that one will want, especially on slide six, on the investment pledge, there were pledges made of 1.1 trillion since the start of the investment conference. There's further indication that a significant implementation of commitment has been made. How many have materialized and in what sectors and how many jobs have they created? I, I think that one can be clarified too. The other one will be to what extent has this still master plan support 
supported new entrants into the industry? And how has the master plan ensured the viability of the SMEs? Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Malamacha, Honorable Motau. Thanks, Chair, for the opportunity. Let me welcome the, all the presentations for today. Um, I have only two questions, uh, Minister. One, on slide 44, to what extent are legal imports from China undermining our efforts of reindustrializations? And how it is, how is it impacting local industries and has been done practically outside of discussions held with the Chinese embassy? Lastly, uh, the department has limited authorities on industrial parks, which are mainly the preserve of provincial government. What is the department doing to improve their efficiency and growth as they are critical in creating jobs and driving our industrial competitiveness? Thanks, Chair. Thank you, uh, Honorable Burns Namashe. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, yeah, Honorable Chair. Um, I just want to, yeah, I, I, I take it that the AG is still around, Honorable Chair. Am I correct? They are on the platform. Yes, I see them. Okay. Well, Chair, there's a uh, well, well, in, in, in welcoming uh, their report as well as that of uh, the department. Uh, maybe if I can start with the AG. Um, having identified uh, such a, a clearing um, um, audit um, irregularities, uh, especially at the NLC, um, is there a system through which they can readily identify some of these challenges within real time. Um, you know, because sometimes, uh, sometimes, um, you know, this thing of uh, identifying uh, challenges after the fact is it, really becoming a problem. Um, um, I, I just want to check if uh, there could be a system which could um, uh, mitigate, you know, uh, and or uh, circumvent uh, some of these weaknesses in such a way that um, um, instead of um, finding ourselves deep into a wasteful and or irregular expenditure, there's a way to avoid that. And, and then in, in respect of the department chair, um, the, 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 the pandemic, uh, which is COVID, as well as the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, you know, have actually demonstrated the extent to which South Africa um, should build internal resilience and self-sufficiency. Um, so as to reduce uh, dependence on imports. You know, uh, one of the ways to achieve this, of course, through localization and beneficiation. So the question that I would have, what direct benefits have the South African economy derived from its localization policy? Um, of course, we, 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 this could also be looked at in terms of uh, what is the impact of uh, the structural adjustment program as well as the sovereign debt and conditionalities posed by such uh, institutional arrangements in respect of these uh, 
international monetary organization, be it IMF or World Bank, in ways that contribute to the deregulation. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable String. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, firstly, also just appreciation for the, uh, the presentations from the AG as well as uh, from the department. Um, first question, uh, Minister, uh, how do you plan to implement the Auditor General recommendations on reducing or reviewing the external uh, legal services, the use of external legal services, where 31% of goods and services uh, spending at the National Lotteries Commission relates to legal fees. So this, this question is uh, particularly relevant, noting that there is an uh, internal legal unit of some eight employees uh, with a wage bill of, of 8.9 million rand per annum. And the second is uh, what, if any, um, are the timelines um, for appointing, as recommended by the Auditor General, for appointing at, at SABS a permanent CEO and a fully functional board uh, to lead and govern the, the entity? And then I think just my, my last well, question or comment, um, while we appreciate the, the pledges of um, you know hundreds of, of millions of rands um, for the various projects and industrial development in in, in, in South Africa, um, which is an attempt to to drive industrialization um, uh, and hence also increase employment. But these particular pledges projects are clearly uh, insufficient to turn around uh, and to make any dent to our huge unemployment burden, which is set to exceed uh, some 40% according to, to some predictions. And so when, when viewed against our current unemployment rate, uh, where the department's policies are actually failing to, to cause um, the unemployment rate uh, and hence poverty and, and inequality to decrease, um, what then are the plans to, to look at, uh, rather than uh, capital intensive uh, initiatives, um, labor intensive initiatives to reduce unemployment? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Thring. Honorable Moatse. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Let me also join other members for welcoming the presentation of the AG and the department. Uh, I've got uh, only two questions. First question uh, is for department. Just want to know how has the steel master plan support downstream industries and what opportunities have been created? Then lastly, uh, Minister, noting that government is the biggest procurer of goods and services, what, to what extent is the government supporting the procurement of local producer, produced vehicle to ensure the sustainability of the automotive industry support vehicle, support and, and viable? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Moatsi. Honorable Mbuyani. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for the opportunity. Chair, also welcoming the reports, both reports, AGs, and uh, the Minister's uh, report. Uh, as we look uh, at this report, we, we need to look at the impact made by uh, this achievement uh, from the department. Uh, what is it that they had in terms of the job creation? And uh, also we must check as to why does it seem uh, that they're unable to drive up 
uh, our mandate as the manufacturing capacity and create jobs as well. There's also one uh, 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 clarity that I need to understand, man. Can we be clarified by the role of the trade lead? There's a name called trade lead and their operation in terms of transformational agenda industrialization. Uh, the minister spoke of the who, who is who uh, versus transformational and industrialization program uh, in terms of the competition commission. And also, I think in terms of that, uh, I just want to check because the increase in concentration of our economy poses a serious threat uh, towards the sustenance of SMMEs, which undermine inclusive economic growth and the potential of creation of jobs. And uh, I just wanted to check also what is the uh, commission playing, uh, maybe the role in preventing this from happening. And further, what collaborative efforts have been uh, the Commission undertaken with the relevant stakeholders to ensure that SME are not look, locked out of participation in the uh, main in the inclusive economy? Maybe the department, there's a uh, proactive measures that are being adopted by the Commission to ensure that markets uh, do get overly concentration, concentrated, maybe. Uh, noting that there's a high degree of inequality in distribution of firm income with a share of turnover of largest 10% of firm was on average of 85.8% turnover in South Africa with the bottom 50% of firms, uh, which are all SME, receiving a shares of 1.6% of total economic turnover. Uh, this is very concerning, uh, means we are struggling to transform our economy, perhaps explain the reason why our economy is unable to create jobs as an SME. Uh, can I therefore uh, get a clarity, what is the role of the Commission playing in transforming this? And that uh, also the stakeholders are part of this uh, whole uh, uh, process. There's one disturbing issue share in terms of the concentration of transformation. In the real estate and the services sector, the three largest made of 59 uh, or 60% of assets under management of 13 listed firms. The sector is also highly concentrated, notwithstanding in the fact that all real estate firms are listed. And this may not be correct reflection of the reality. However, the commission considered conducting a market inquiry into real estate sector in terms of the section 43B1 of the Competition Act to consider whether there's any distortion or restriction of competition in this sector of the real estate sector. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Biani. Honorable McPherson. Thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> just sort of a bro uh, overarching question for the minister. If things are uh, as well functioning and well put uh, by the department today, um, what is the minister's view in the that not translating into economic growth and uh, job creation. So, so, so where is the, the missing link into how well the department presents its performance and what that actually translates into economic realities? And maybe if he could just give us what his view might be for, uh, for what is missing or why it is not translating into economic growth and job, creator, uh, job creation. Um, I'd also just like to know where the auto green paper um, adoption um, in terms of 
uh, cabinet and progression on that fits into uh, into the presentation today and whether that is linked to a performance uh, outcome because that is outstanding for for more than a year and then i'd also like to know where and um, trade agreements uh, fit into uh, 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 performance indicators particularly the review on AGOA and the EPA uh, because those are coming up pretty quickly and, and, and how does the department measure its performance in securing a, um, renewal uh, of those agreements and then lastly with respect to the investment drive, the numbers we're told, what percentage of the 1.1 trillion is actually Brownfield's investment? So brand new, uh, completely new, never been in South Africa before versus investment in existing projects and investments that were scheduled by businesses to take place already so that's the first one and 1.1 leg of the question and the second is do you think it's right to measure government entities uh, expanding their investment which is essentially taxpayers money being used to create the impression that there's investment in those so like transnet as an example, and some of the others that are often cited as investments. So those would just be my questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Honorable McPherson. There being no further hands, I would just like to add that as the uh, portfolio committee, I think we will keep a special eye and work out a roadmap for, for the NLC in terms of our oversight role because it is concerning what we see there, what we hear from the AG and from the annual report. And then I think for me, um, is there any way we can um, strengthen um, our, our uh, executive authority or any, any way we can strengthen our hand in the way industrial parks are managed because we know that many of them are not um, functioning optimally because we saw the report, the overall report on, on, in the annual report on industrial parks, but obviously we don't see it against uh, what was there before. Because for instance, when we did oversight at Ecandustria, we first of all found out that the, it, the, the, the industrial park falls under Pumalanga, but they pay services to, uh, to uh, Tuane, um, and that there was quite a high vacancy rate and vandalism of, of, of existing infrastructure. So I think, you know, it, 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 would be, it would be good to hear what the department's plan is in that regard. But let me hand over first to the office of the AG, and then, um, and then to the minister and his team. Mr. Shabangu or Mr. Posa, I'm not sure if Mr. Posa is back. Uh, I'm back, Chair, uh, and thank you very much. Uh, I, I will, I will, I will respond to the question from Ben Singhanoche. I think that was the only question that was direct to us from the question that the honourable members. Uh, asked uh, and the question was on the irregularities identified in NLC and if there are ways or systems that we can perhaps help to identify these challenges uh, within real time and because of the after effect, effects of the audit identifying them might be a, a, a little bit too late so I think the, the the response to the question is Firstly, by the nature of our work of our regulatory audit, it always going to always going to be an after effect because we will be auditing 
reports that have to be prepared uh, in terms of the financial statements and also for the performance report. Uh, those that have to be prepared by the management, then we will come after to the, the 14 line with the uh, PFMA. But I think as we have seen with uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, and now most recently the post unrest, uh, there is an opportunity to perform relative amortization where and necessary. Uh, the office is open to that. Uh, that through, due to the nature of or the of the seriousness of the issues like the COVID-19 uh, funds and uh, the post unrest fund, there was work that the office approved to be done as real time. But also in line with our professional standards as auditors, we do allow or we are open to having those kind of management with management or with those sorts of governance to say, if there's an instance where there's a need to do a, an audit in time a, before the actual audit, maybe it is something that is agreed upon. A, a, looking at the resources a, that we have and the time, a, like times, and, 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 the, and the personnel to perform those audits. Our office is always open to a person management, and then we can have those uh, real-time audits to ensure that the controls that are there, uh, we will review the controls and ensure the controls are preventative in nature to ensure that the fruitlessness and, and the irregularities do not happen or were detected before the, the amounts are spent. So I think that's the response to the question. I'm not sure if I fully uh, responded to the question from the honorable member. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you very much. I think you have, um, Mr. Poster. Thank you. Uh, Minister? Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And um, thank you to the uh, members for the questions and the comments. And I appreciate the, uh, the positive comments that have been made. Uh, there's about 15 or so questions, uh, uh, just over 15 questions. So I'm going to try to see where I can combine some of them and, and run through it and see if the DG would like to add then or any of the team members. Starting with the, um, the issue around the investment pledges that's come up uh, from uh, Honorable Malamecha, as well as uh, uh, Honorable McPherson. The, uh, the pledges that have been received to date is 1.1 trillion rand. And uh, as we were preparing for the investment, uh, the last investment conference, some 330 billion of that had already flowed, meaning that either it's in projects that are completed. An example of a completed project would be Mercedes Benz uh, that I referred to, where they made a commitment in 2018. It took them a couple of years then to get the implementation going because it means reorganizing the shop floor, uh, getting new machinery in, changing the model uh, to the new model, and then uh, implementing it. Some of them are where you've got a large mining development where uh, over a couple of years, you are digging that mine, you're building the structures to support it, you get the machinery in there to move the uh, ore uh, up and so on. And so in, in a case like that, you may not have completed the full project within the available time uh, or, or to date, but that would then be rolled out. That's why each of the pledges are typically over a five-year period. Some are realized, of course, sooner, but generally companies from the moment when they take a decision that they're going to invest, they do it that way. Now, some of the sub uh, questions that have come up is, um, how do we uh, distinguish between uh, what was already planned and uh, and what is not planned, uh, brown fields versus green field, and uh, public entity versus private entity. If I can take those as a group of related questions. First on the uh, investment, from our um, uh, drive to get investment going, we're trying to, uh, to expand the overall output of the South African economy. And with that, the number of jobs and economic opportunities. Now, there is no artificial distinction between a brown field and a, and a green field. Let me use an example. If we have a, a, an existing plant that produces 100,000 uh, uh, pins uh, per, per month, and it recapitalizes its business, it gets new technology, it upgrades the skill, the management, and it's able to increase its output to 200,000 pence per month. Uh, that is a real increase in uh, the productive capacity of South Africa with all the other benefits that come with it that I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. If 
In a, uh, uh, instead of that, there was a new factory set up that also produces, let's say, 100,000 pins or even 50,000 pins. Uh, there, there is no um, a priori sense of why green fields is better than brown fields. So what we're looking at is trying to uh, strengthen the investment commitments by firms that can increase aggregate output in the economy, whether it is through expanding an existing capacity, whether it's building a new one. Obviously, what we're also keen on is looking at the new opportunities in areas that South Africa has not been involved in. And so that would be some of the green energy areas, the production of components for green energy, some of the digital technologies and so on. So there's a different set of criteria that, uh, that apply. Uh, on the matter of whether a company would already have planned it, if you have a weak investment environment, a company may ordinarily invest. But when uh, that environment is very weak, it puts a pause on all investment uh, or often does so. And so part of our drive through Invest South Africa is to help improve the investment environment. And that gives companies the confidence to publicly say, we will undertake an investment. So um, I would um, I would say a number of the the projects that we we've announced are are new ones. And uh, what what we do now more and more when we announce when we do these uh, opportunities to open a factory or open a production line or open a new uh, facility, we we indicate how that is linked to the investment conference. Uh, just to, by way of illustration. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I went to a, a very big factory opening in uh, KZN uh, that has um, uh, now about 4,000 workers producing electric harnesses. And we will be reporting in quarter one and quarter two uh, on that. So I don't want to go into too much detail of it now. But there, that commitment was made at an investment conference. Uh, similarly, uh, on that same day, I was part of uh, uh, the president officially opening a um, pulping facility in uh, KwaZulu-Natal uh, that's quite large with a very significant export uh, 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 impact. And it was taking essentially an existing plant and really expanding that plant very, very significantly to be able to do this. Uh, and, and there are many examples. So we are going to, in the reporting for, for the um, uh, six-month period uh, we're working on now, we're going to, to indicate the connection between what we announce and the investment conference. It's typically done in the speeches at these events, but those speeches don't always, uh, or that part is not always in the public domain. The media may not cover that particular part. So we're going to do more on that. On the question of public and private investment, they are both drivers of growth. So if Transnet actually uh, increases its investment level, it's something that we think we should report on. And what we've seen in the last, um, uh, in the period from about 2015, 2016, was a sharp decline in public investment, which um, uh, most economists would say is one of the contributors to um, to slowing economic uh, growth. We had quite a significant boost in infrastructure spending from the period of about 2008, 2007, through to about 2014, 2015. Um, and um, uh, some of that was around the 2010 World Cup. Uh, some of them were in industrial activities. And so we're now trying to get the public investment level up. Uh, all over the world, everybody is looking at levels of public investment. It's in the United States, in China, in the European Union, as an important complement to private investment. So I think, Honorable McPherson, yes, I think it is helpful and valuable that we increase public investment. In fact, part of uh, ESCOM's challenge and storyline is the weakness in maintaining the levels of investment that's required in maintenance of its plants. Uh, and uh, that's come back uh, to significantly impact performance of its plants. Very often they break down because we haven't done the necessary investment 
to upgrade, to improve, to do maintenance and so on. So investment is not only about green fields, important as it is, it's also these uh, complementary uh, levels of, um, of investment that together uh, ensures that we're able to achieve what we need to achieve. Then Honorable Malamecha also raised the uh, question around the SABS board and uh, it was picked up also by Honorable Tring. So we advertised for, um, uh, and we looked for uh, uh, persons who can who can be in on the board of SABS. When we looked at it, we found that we didn't have enough people who had been in the original list of people proposed by the department with the requisite technical expertise uh, before the end of this financial year, sooner, not right to the end of the financial year, it's our intention to uh, announce the new board of SABs. It is an important area now that we can see progress being made on the NLC front, uh, which was our major challenge in the past. We can now shift focus to improving uh, governance at SABs. And of course, the new board would then play quite a key role in helping to appoint a new CEO. So this is an area we're going to move uh, much faster uh, in the period ahead. Uh, Honorable uh, Motong raised the question of imports from China, referring to slide 44. Now, slide 44 is the, the level of working together with the Chinese authorities to try to address a number of challenges that uh, we've had. We've pointed in that slide to the example of oysters that were not in the um, the list of uh, products that we were able to, to uh, export to China. And uh, we were able to resolve that one, which uh, assists in getting uh, South African oysters uh, back into the Chinese market and uh, save jobs in the oyster industry. We've raised uh, concerns around uh, illegal imports. We had some uh, collaboration with the Chinese authorities in dealing with a group of uh, companies that imported from China and they just completely misrepresented the value of the products. And uh, we received information from the Chinese authorities that were used by SARS in court. In fact, I will be um, uh, asking that that particular matter be reported to in the Q1 report because we got the court case was resolved in, uh, in June this year, if my memory serves me. So that's an example of where we try to work with trading partners to resolve some of the challenges. Honorable Mutong raised the issue of industrial parks, uh, which was a point picked up also, Chairperson, by yourself. And essentially, it is one of the uh, challenges we've had with the, the, um, uh, the fact that national government has very limited power on industrial parks. So what we're doing here is we, we, we're working on a new spatial development program that is intended to uh, link uh, national government support to uh, the, the uh, right of national government to, to help improve governance and ensure that we have the appropriate people appointed to head these parks and that there is a, a coordinated drive to get more investment into it. Uh, in a number of uh, instances where the deputy ministers, Deputy Minister Majola, Deputy Minister Gina have visited these parks and they've um, shared the outcome uh, with me, uh, we, we can see that many of the parks have just not been maintained well enough that investors would want to use them. I don't want to preempt the, the outcome of the review that the department is doing, but I have asked the department to look more carefully at an appropriate role for the private sector in industrial parks, because we don't need to have only a, a publicly owned model or publicly uh, managed model. We can find a way in which we can look at a better partnership to get these parks working better and uh, being more effective. Now, of course, we do need the buy-in of provinces and in some cases, local authorities. Uh, so it is a process of engaging with them. But uh, at some point, um, uh, we are going to have to uh, finalize a, a view on it and then uh, adopt that policy after taking it through cabinet and then uh, make that um, the new basis. So uh, Chair, both you and uh, Honorable Motong has raised, uh, I think, an, uh, a, a focus on an important area. 
uh, Honorable Burns Amashi, on the benefits of localization policy, which is, I think, what the question is directed to us. Uh, th there's a number of, of real benefits. Uh, we can take any, any product uh, uh, as an example. If we take uh, the clothing that South Africans buy, when we successfully localize that, it means a bigger portion of that clothing is manufactured uh, in uh, South African um, uh, firms or in firms located in South Africa. Uh, and, and what that, the benefits that we get from it are, first of all, increased number of jobs for uh, for South Africans, particularly for young people. The second one is we increase the GDP output uh, of the economy, which helps in a number of ways. One of it is that uh, a growing economy allows the fiscus, the uh, receiver of revenue, as they used to be called, uh, now the South African Revenue Service, to uh, be able to get a higher tax take, which assists then with. Um, payments for hospitals and um, uh, water infrastructure, energy infrastructure, all of the things that the state pays uh, for, uh, that's enhanced when you have greater output. Uh, also, localization helps to provide more economic opportunities for small businesses and for new entrants uh, in the market. And above all, it, it helps to provide greater resilience uh, in the economy. One of the senior executives of Toyota came to one of the launches of one of the vehicles, uh, and uh, I had the opportunity to meet with him prior to the uh, the formal event where we went on the production floor. And he said to me that uh, when South Africa raised the localization issue a couple of years ago, uh, Toyota accepted that that's a new framework, and they started to work with it, and they said, one of the benefits that they believe they're getting from it is by having a local supply chain in an uncertain world where supply chains are disrupted, it gives them uh, 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 an edge, uh, a, an advantage. And that was one comment. We've heard more and more of those kind of comments as I've engaged with uh, global businesses who have operations in South Africa. So there are all these benefits. And uh, when we, in our Quarterly reports, we, we uh, report on some of the big uh, uh, industrial initiatives, a, a factory that opens, uh, uh, a expansion. All of those are the examples of it. And they show real jobs that are created and real industrial output that is um, uh, uh, secured. Honorable uh, Tring then raised the question of that while investment is welcome, it's not making a sufficient dent on uh, on unemployment. I would have a different um, uh, way of putting it. It's not that the department's uh, policies are failing, Honorable Tring, I would want to um, respectfully suggest, but the size of the challenge to be faced requires even more. And it comes, and I want to link that to Honorable McPherson's question, who's and Honorable McPherson said, well, if things are functioning so well, uh, should we not be seeing this more in the macro data, the, the growth rate and job creation, and what is that relationship? Now, um, I think it's a, it's a useful uh, prompt that the questions have given us to be able to, to talk about the fact that there are a number of different factors that influence the outcome of, a, uh, uh, of an economy. Uh, a ministry with a mandate to build houses have a relatively smaller number of uh, variables that they need to navigate. Uh, and um, uh, it's a matter of getting the right um, uh, amount of money, uh, having a proper uh, program to ensure that contractors commit to, buy, uh, to building X number of houses and then managing it. A modern economy is, is as, as all members of the committee uh, uh, no, and would and some would have pointed out in the past, it's a complex thing. It's affected by external things. We may have a uh, a program to grow the export of our oranges, and our farmers would be doing a marvelous job. And then suddenly there would be a trade restriction that is imposed by, let's say, the European Union, and that would then dampen growth. 
uh, or uh, there would be a war that breaks out in Ukraine and it interrupts our supply of citrus fruit to um, markets uh, affected by the conflict. Um, or out of a Ukrainian uh, conflict, the price of fuel goes up across the globe and that then uh, has a knock-on effect on prices in South Africa. Or we have our fertilizer supply chains cut, which then limits or puts up the price of fertilizers that our farmers use. So those would be one set of circumstances that happen offshore. Other set of circumstances that would happen onshore would be energy shortages, uh, challenges with uh, logistics, uh, sometimes uh, decisions by local authorities that limit the impact of an investment or, or slows it down or delays it. Part of what we're building up with Invest SA is the ability to unblock uh, administrative decisions uh, and administrative procedures that that hold back the the growth and the job numbers. If we had to take the DTIC out of the equation, there would be a significant number of uh, jobs that would be lost in the South African economy a huge amount of output that would be gone. Um, so what we do is we try in the areas where we have the ability to either um, influence very greatly or it is completely within our control to make a difference. And then sometimes we benefit from external factors over which we have no control uh, and they help to boost. They are what you can call your, your tailwinds. They help to push you further. Sometimes we get obstructed by uh, external factors uh, that we, we're not able to manage. And that would be your headwinds. They slow down how much you do. You can put your pedal down on the, um, the uh, um, uh, accelerator as much as you do, whatever the equivalent is that an aircraft does. But when those headwinds are, are heavy, um, you, you do get buffeted by them. So I think that what, what we try to do in these reports is identify projects that we've worked on where through the collaboration between the private sector and the public sector, we get them over the finish line. We either create new jobs or we are able to save existing jobs uh, and, um, and do as many of these where we feel we're getting things right. We try to scale them up. And uh, at the end of the day, while we can't control the external environment, whether it's domestic external environment outside the DTIC or the global external environment, we, can't, we can make a difference to the overall growth rate and to the overall jobs numbers. And that means doing what we can control and what we can directly influence as efficiently as possible, avoiding corruption in uh, any of that, uh, avoiding maladministration and inefficiency in it, and just lifting the impact much more clearly. And then as the external factors begin to ease up and become better, they can then uh, complement what we're doing. And then the overall outcome is, uh, is, is hopefully uh, significantly better than what we can do on our own. But given that there are these external factors, uh, as the DTIC, and I've raised it with the staff repeatedly, we shouldn't rely on those as the excuses. Just keep doing whatever you can do as well as you can do it. And external circumstances will sometimes get more difficult. Sometimes they will improve. Uh, you can't focus all of your effort on the things that you can't influence. It's the things that you can influence that you need to do as best as you can. And where you drop the ball, as is the case in any human activity, pick it up, try to see if we can resolve it. Sometimes there are trade-offs. You can't get the best of both. Make a decision, uh, go for that decision, and that decision is informed by our overall strategy and our overall strategy we have set out previously in uh, the committee when we set out the annual performance plan. Moving next to the uh, question Honorable Tring asked about labor-intensive initiatives. So we need to do a combination of these various things, uh, Honorable Tring, and I think it's important to focus also on the labor intensive. In our master plans, we've tried to select 
a combination of those master plans of sectors that are more capital intensive, like your steel industry, and those that are more labor intensive, like your clothing industry and your furniture industry. We've also tried to say within a sector, like the auto sector, while a lot of our coordination is with the large auto assemblers, our work increasingly is on the downstream component makers and trying to get those component uh, numbers up because that's where the big job numbers are. For every one job we have in auto assembly, we now have two direct jobs in the production of components that go into those factories. So even where you have a sector like car making, where the top part has a degree of, uh, of uh, capital intensity, uh, once you get into the component part, you can do more. So obviously within the budget that we have available, uh, we've got to be able to do a lot more. I hope what one of the areas we, we're able to highlight more and more in future is how we're trying to use resources outside our own budget, because the entire budget of the DTIC is absolutely tiny compared to the scale of the challenge we face. We can complain about it. It's not really the best way to, to conduct governance to complain. The better way is to say, where can we get money? What can we do that may not require money, but that can help to boost growth and jobs? And we'll give many examples of these in the quarterly reports. And for the new quarterly reports, we hope we can lift the, the um, examples out more clearly that we don't focus on what it is that the department is contributed by the amount of industrial funding, because frankly, that's really a means to an end, that our reporting must focus on the impact, what we've actually achieved through that. And that's what we're going to focus on. Honorable Moatsi has raised the question of the steel master plan and its uh, support for downstream industries. The uh, reports that we've given in the past have highlighted increasingly the work we do. For example, on trade, we, we gave the example of wheelbarrows. Now, wheelbarrows is a downstream product. It's not the steel that is produced by the steel makers. It's, uh, they would use um, steel that have been locally produced. The car industry is another example where we see more opportunity to use South African steel in downstream uh, uh, examples. And of course, tool making is quite important. On procurement, our principal support on procurement is to try to, to get uh, a great uh, uh, support uh, for making of cars in South Africa using the APDP. And uh, the state uh, procurement, of course, has to comply also with all the prescripts of uh, Treasury. I must say, I drive a locally made uh, vehicle and I find it to, to give me very, very good service. Uh, one of the vehicles um, uh, I think we had um, uh, must have been for uh, close to a decade, if my memory serves me properly. And it was locally made car and it's, it's robust. It's able to, to um, uh, give the service. Uh, uh, and, and, and that's important that we're also able to show that we, own, we don't only do local procurement because it makes sense in terms of jobs and um, uh, the uh, uh, development that we want, but also many South African products are, are world-class and they produce here, but they are sold all over the world. I gave the example earlier of the um, anesthetic that we make. It will be used in hospitals right across the world. Uh, Honorable Mbuyani has raised the question around trade leads. And uh, on trade leads, what we do is we, when we have an exhibition, uh, we have private sector companies there and they then engage with people who come to the exhibition. It's, sometimes it's retailers, sometimes it's uh, global um, uh, uh, traders, people who import from different countries in the world. Sometimes it's um, uh, uh, industrial companies who need components. And those trade leads are generated in the discussion between that company and, um, uh, and its customer or its supplier. Sometimes we get trade leads from 
South African embassies abroad who say that they've been approached. Can uh, would South Africa be be able to provide a particular uh, product uh, in in a local market? Sometimes those trade leads come from the work that we do on the visits that the president uh, uh, does to different countries, where uh, we've done a, a major drive in West Africa. We we're about to do one in Saudi Arabia and Kenya. And these ones are about selling South African products and South African firms to uh, global uh, global markets. Uh, Honorable Mbuyan has also raised the question of the competition concentration report and what steps the competition commission is taking. I would identify four, four steps that the commission is taking. The first is they're focusing uh, carefully on um, market inquiries. And so they take each market um, and when they believe that there is uh, grounds for it, they do a market inquiry. They're busy at the moment on a major market inquiry uh, on online platforms. They're also busy now with an online, with a market inquiry on uh, fresh uh, uh, produce uh, that would be uh, part of like vegetables and so on that would be uh, their focus. And um, uh, and that's uh, an important area. The second one is uh, in mergers, they look at whether a merger will increase concentration. And if it does, uh, is there a compelling public interest reason to permit that um, merger or should the merger be prohibited? Uh, on uh, cartels, which is the third one, they, they look at um, cartels in concentrated markets it's easier to get um, collusion going in highly competitive markets. Uh, the value of cartels to those firms is much less. So they look at uh, cartels and they've had quite a lot of success in what we can call cartel busting. And then finally, they look at um, abuse of dominance where large firms uh, are able to take their market power and keep smaller players out or visit high costs on consumers. And those, um, those ones are quite a significant part. We found that the law was inadequate to deal with the issue of um, market concentration. So uh, we had already gotten a early version of the Competition Commission report in 2017, and that uh, contributed to a major review of competition policy and changes to the law that were introduced in 2019. And now any cases that the Competition in, uh, Commission is investigating can use these new provisions in the law. Uh, Honorable McPhears, uh, Honorable Buyani asked about the property sector. It's quite, a, quite an important sector, uh, but the Competition Commission has got a large number of sectors that are potentially subject to a market inquiry. So they look at a range of criteria to identify a sector and they take into account the resources that they have available. The new commissioner building on the, the really good work of the previous commissioner is looking at uh, measures to expand capacity in uh, the conduct of market inquiries. And I've had a meeting with the commissioner which has outlined what is some of her pre preliminary thinking. She's just taken office um, uh, uh, recently and uh, she, is, uh, she is quite keen on expanding this work. So um, uh, that deals with the, uh, the property sector issue. Honorable McPherson has raised the question on the auto green paper uh, adoption. So we published the auto green paper last year. We did quite careful work in evaluating public comments and we then did a costing exercise based on the expectation of the industry. The, uh, the result was a very expensive bill that was not going to be affordable to South Africa in that form that was originally published. And, uh, uh, and uh, the proposals made by some of the stakeholders in their public comments. So we've had quite a few meetings with the uh, auto industry subsequently to look at different options that can help to make the system affordable, the shift to electric vehicles more affordable. At the moment, we've resolved many of the issues. The key issue now is budget. And that, as honorable members know, is always the most challenging part of uh, new policy. 
So it's really finalizing the discussions between the DTIC and National Treasury that would enable us to, uh, to finalize the, the roadmap on electric vehicles. So while some positive things are already beginning to happen on electric vehicles, the big shift is getting the, uh, the budget sorted out. In respect of the budget, one area we've looked at is the uh, commitments made by partner countries. We've been working with France and Germany and the UK and the United States. They've put some um, uh, resources, resource commitment on the table. When we've looked carefully at the terms of it, it's not the most generous uh, offer uh, that has been put. Uh, and um, those discussions are continuing as recently as a uh, I think about uh, two weeks ago, we had a meeting of the uh, interministerial committee to evaluate some of the progress that has been made uh, in those talks. And because those talks are with counterparties that we would be seeking to have their money on the table to help us in our transition to a green economy, to a, a lower carbon emitting economy. Uh, and given the challenges that Treasury faces, we've had to take all of this into account in landing the green paper uh, and finalizing it. So the, the DTIC, narrowly the work there has been done. It's now a matter of getting the resource envelope in place. Uh, on the question of trade agreements and um, the performance indicators, obviously on a goer, we're working um, hard now for the, the next period, I will be, um, meeting with African trade ministers and with uh, the US uh, uh, trade minister um, in uh, December this year, uh, where we will again be talking through the AGOA issues and then South Africa will then host the AGOA forum uh, next year where we will have uh, everybody meeting physically. We hope uh, circumstances will enable a physical meeting and um, all of that is really about trying to put the, the social case, the economic case, and let's call it the diplomatic case for um, the continuation of a go. At the end of the day, it requires a decision by another party. And so all we can do is put our best put uh, foot forward, our best arguments forward, lift out the benefits that Africa will have and even that the US will have uh, in, in doing that. But um, uh, our ability to, uh, as in any contractual negotiation, uh, our ability is on influence rather than on guaranteed outcome. At the end of the day, the American political system is complex. A lot depend on uh, their midterm elections. What is the mood of the new Congress? And those are all matters that we'll try our best to put the best case for South Africa forward and then um, uh, hope that a compelling rational case can work. On EPA, it's the same. These are negotiations. Uh, no doubt um, our trading partners would want uh, something from us. We certainly have a list of things we would like from them too. Uh, and these are complex negotiations uh, in which it's a careful uh, balancing that both parties seek to do. And, um, uh, we measure our performance in how well our team is able to make its compelling proposition. But all of these are ultimately political decisions that governments make. The, the U.S. administration will make a decision at some point through the U.S. Congress. So it's not even a decision that a trade minister makes. It's a decision ultimately that the U.S. Congress will make. Uh, on the EPA, it's a decision ultimately politically that the um, uh, 27 European Union countries will make and they will then debate and work through. So, um, and within that, there are many and complex trade-offs um, that we, 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 we need to work. Each time we meet a minister or a head of state, we put the South African argument very, very strongly. Um, I hope that's covered uh, at least the main questions that have come up, uh, Chairperson. And um, your, your remark about strengthening the DTIC's hand in dealing with spatial economic development is a particularly apt one. Um, and uh, we, will, we will pay attention to that. Of course, we are talking uh, also to 
to provinces uh, about uh, how to get a better and more effective system in place around these issues. Um, Chair, I don't know if that um, uh, uh, if there were any big gaps uh, that you'd like us to cover, but that uh, represents a broad um, uh, uh, response to the issues that have come up. And Minister, I've been ticking as you have gone uh, through the responses, and I think we are fairly covered. Can I just put it to the committee to hear whether you are fully covered? If we see no further hands, we can conclude our discussions for today. I see no further hands, Minister, so I think we, you have covered um, all the inputs. Um, thank you very much to, uh, to the AG, the Office of the AG that has been in our meeting today for the entire meeting and also the Minister and his team. Uh, we will continue to have a robust relationship in doing oversight over the work of the department or with, this, with, a, with the mandate of, of providing a better life uh, for all South African citizens, as has been uh, repeatedly said by the Office of the AG. Uh, thank you very much to everyone who's been present in the meeting. I now just hand over to the secretary to indicate to us our business uh, tomorrow when we meet. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, tomorrow we'll be meeting um, on the platform and we'll be briefed by, we'll have a follow-up briefing from uh, as a result of an oversight that we had in April, where we'll get a briefing, an update, a status report on issues that committee raised during the oversight visit. That meeting, it would be scheduled for tomorrow. I will distribute, I just received the, uh, um, the presentations and I will distribute it shortly, Chair, thanks. Thank you very much, um, committee secretary and uh, to the committee unit who has been working on the work of the committee. Um, we'll see each other tomorrow. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleagues. Bye. Bye. <laughs>